All right, it looks like we have everyone here. Laura, are we ready? We are. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Garrick, Councilor Garrick Perry. I'm the chair of the Community Resources Meeting. And this is September 19th, 2022. And I would like to welcome you to this meeting. But first, I want to tell everyone that this meeting is being audio and video recorded. Um, there will be time to take a comments, and I'll talk about that later. But first, Laura, can we have a roll call? Sure. Councillor Perry. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. And Councillor Mayori. Here. All right. Looks like we have a quorum here. Now, if anyone has looked at the agenda, you will see that there appears to be two places for public comment on the agenda. So the first is a general public comment. And so if anyone has any general comments, I will open up the floor for that. Uh, I will also say that after the roundtable discussion, there will be a period where the public can make some comments. Um, I will also just state for the record that this meeting is not uh, to discuss um, either one location uh, for dispensary or capping dispensaries. This really is a roundtable to get information. It's a fact-finding uh, roundtable discussion to have different voices speak up. Um, I will say this a little bit later as I introduce the roundtable, but with that being said, I do open the floor for just general public comments. And Lizzie has their hand up. Um. I don't know how general this is, but I can't be here to the end of the meeting because I have a small child. So I'm just gonna go for it. I'm Lizzie, I'm a sober marijuana addict and a longtime resident of Northampton. And I wanna say once again, that pot addiction is real, it's agony, and that it's quieter and easier to hide than most addictions. And I wanna address tonight one of the biggest myths being spread in this discussion about dispensaries the myth that there is a bias against pot that does not exist for alcohol. This myth is in fact a lie. It is an argument left over from the days when pot was illegal in this state. It is no longer relevant. As a member of AA who has been sober a long time, I find this argument manipulative, insulting, and a flat out lie. Alcohol is a runaway train. We need to prevent the pot industry from being allowed to take that same path. There are caps on liquor licenses. And we are asking for a cap on marijuana. We need to put safeguards in place now to protect people before this gets more out of control. Northampton is becoming a cautionary tale for other communities of what not to allow to happen in their cities and towns. I have lived experience, listen to me. Thousands of people in Northampton are being hurt by the onslaught of dispensaries. Thousands of people in recovery, a multitude of people in active addiction, many of whom are able to cover up their addiction because of the quietness of pot addiction. Their suffering is real, their families are suffering. Adolescents are being lied to in the same way I was, the lie that pot is harmless. In my experience, pot is very similar to alcohol. Some can enjoy it and that's fine, but for many of us, our lives are completely dismantled by it. Dispensaries and their consultants are just dressed up versions of the drug pushers I dealt with when I was using. I wanna say this, only the city council can stop this. This is a quiet fire raging in Northampton and only the city council can put it out by placing a cap. Thank you. Thank you, Lizzie. I see that Jackie Ballin says her hand up. Jackie. There, there, I'm un unmuted. I just want to repeat what I said at the uh, Florence and Leeds Civic Association meeting a, a while ago that this roundtable is a wonderful gift to the community. It's a conversation we need to have 
I'm only disappointed that you have experts from mental health and experts from the industry, but you don't have people from the community in the round table. There is an impact on the community. And I would like, maybe you could work weave that into your discussion. I also wanna say that I'm very happy to see the ACLU here. And I imagine that y'all are going to continue to support the ban on facial recognition software by the municipal authorities. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Are there any other public comments at this point for general public? Wendy. Hello, thank you for having this meeting and inviting all the uh, experts who are here tonight. Um, I do wanna address one of the experts. Um, it was drawn to our attention late that um, one of the um, experts um, that's from uh, representing the cannabis industry is uh, in a, I think it presents a difficult situation here. I think um, given that there's a contract really being negotiated with the city, it, 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 it's an uh, inappropriate person to have representing the industry. We have so many other people, lawyers in town like Dick Evans and Mike Cutler and others who could probably present the same information. So I was quite stunned when I saw uh, Mr. Parzabak on the agenda. Um, I also just wanted to, to say, um, relative to the idea of having balance at these meetings, I was at your um, council meeting, subcommittee co committee meeting, where you had the ACLU in to talk about the facial recognition software, but in terms of balance, there was nobody there from the police department. So I'm not sure, you know, I'm sort of wondering about that. And I do appreciate that you want to seek various representation or various opinions. Um, and also, again, um, as far as having people represented here, um, I think Jackie just spoke to members of the community and to echo something that Lizzie just said that was said a lot during the many, many, many conversations we had about policing in Northampton. Lived experience, lived experience, lived experience. And nobody invited to be at the round table tonight to speak at least has publicly said that they have lived experience with addiction um so that that part of the representation is missing thank you thank you so much wendy uh rick you have your hand up you're next okay uh thank you so much and uh thank you uh, for having this discussion uh, my presentation is based on research from the uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse. Just last week, a press release uh, stating prenatal cannabis exposure associated with mental disorders in children persist into early adolescence, and that there's growing uh, uh, research uh, evidence of negative health effects of cannabis use during pregnancy. And this is specifically during the middle of the first trimester, generally after five to uh, six weeks of fetal development associated with attention, social and behavior problems that persist as the effective children uh, progress into early adolescence. That's 11 to 12 years of age. Um, and these conditions may put children, the study goes on at a greater risk of mental health uh, disorders uh, in late uh, adolescence and substance use as well. Typically uh, the most vulnerable age uh, for uh, you know um, these disorders and um, behaviors. Um, so the study tracks nearly 12,000 youths as they grow into young adults. Investigators regularly measure participants' brain structure and activity using MRI. They collect psychological, environmental, and cognitive information, as well as biological uh, samples. Um, so the uh, Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study and ABC um, conducted this. I think uh, the uh, mental health and our substance abuse professionals uh, here now can agree that that's a uh, uh, well-researched uh, and documented study. Uh, I also want to go on that the NIH studied uh, marijuana and hallucinogen use among adults 
reaching an all-time high last year in 2021. And that was adults, young adults, uh, 19 to 30 years old, uh, increased significantly from five to 10 years ago, reaching historic highs in this age group since 1988. And specifically marijuana use, that is past year, past month, and daily marijuana use, that's used on 20 or more occasions in the past 30 days, reached the highest levels ever recorded since these trends were first monitored in 1988. And uh, it, uh, the proportion of young adults who reported past year marijuana use reached 43% in 2021, uh, up from uh, 34% in 2016 and well beyond. Um, so I think the research is clear. I've also cited research, uh, which I've sent out to the uh, uh, council and to the mayor's office, chief of police, everybody involved, uh, that uh, pregnant women, uh, as we mentioned, uh, are affected uh, in their own right in that um, use in early adolescent may lead, lead to lower birth weight of children, even if they have children up until uh, 29 to 30 years old. So like a, you know, a, a decade or more later. So I would uh, implore uh, all of you uh, to support a ban on a cannabis uh, facilities in Northampton. And I would thank you so much for your time and your attention to this important matter. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, Councilor Perry, Councilor yes. Perry, can I, can I have just like one minute before, before you continue? I just, I need one minute. Okay. All right, during this minute for anyone who has just joined, um, I let folks know that this is a chance for general comments, uh, public comments. There is going to be a roundtable discussion later on. Uh, the format will be, there's some brief presentations, and then there will be some back and forth questions with, between counselors and the panel, and then the public will have a chance to make uh, short comments as well. Um, if you were thinking of doing a general comment, please just keep everything civil and you know be respectful of everyone else's time. With that being said, we are just waiting a second for Councillor Elkins. Thank you. No problem. Welcome back. Uh, Sarah Rosenthal, you look like you are next. You have the floor. Hi there, it's actually David Velez, Sarah's husband. Uh, don't know how to change the view thing. Uh, and, and I apologize, my comment is actually about the, the cap in the dispensary, but again, I have to cook in, I won't be able to stay for the whole meeting. Everyone else has spoken eloquently about some of the health issues and the addiction issues. I'm not gonna hit that, but the concern that I have that I've expressed in meetings is really about the character of the town. I'm a Florence resident um, and relatively new to town, about six years here. And I can say in those brief six years, I've seen a transformation of the character of downtown Northampton, what it's known for, what we thought this city was gonna be when we moved here. It is not that, it, it has turned into a, a, a hub of this new burgeoning marijuana industry. And, and that's fine. And we know we were, this was a pioneer city of that. We were the first ones. But now Florence in particular, selfishly my neighborhood, is now targeted, it's up next. And I'll just, again, focus on, I don't think it's appropriate in the dead center, the four corners of town uh, where many, many children walk every day uh, and soon to be my two young children. Uh, it just doesn't seem like the right location. And I know the, the only way to really combat this is with a cap. And I know there is not a cap right now, but the city council has the power to address this with a cap. And I just feel it's appropriate I don't think it's a equivalent to just compare it directly to liquor licenses. This is different. And how many of these businesses is appropriate in one municipality? It seems like this is too much. Uh, it seems like this is not the right location. It's not compatible with the character and the overall image of, again, downtown Florence. When I think of Florence, again, I think of the pie bar, I think of the library, I think of the diner, uh, you know, I think of all those great, you know, the, the rag shag parade. These are reasons why we brought our family here. Another pot shop, 
is not going to help this community. It's not going to help this neighborhood. And I ask the city council to please consider that, address that with whatever power you have, which I believe is the cap, and please take that into consideration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have Lindsay Davidson. Hi, I'm Lindsay. Um, this is my first time uh, attending or speaking at this sort of setting. Um, but I um, want to thank my partner who has our three small kids right now, solo making dinner and giving them dinner so that I could be here at this meeting. I imagine this time um, there are other folks with kids for whom this is a tricky time, but uh, I'm a Florence resident. I am. Um, I have three kids in the Ryan Road School. I'm also a licensed clinical social worker. And so I wanted to make the effort to say that um, it's, you know, four years ago when the first dispensary moved into Northampton um, was right where uh, I got on the highway to take my kids to preschool. And, you know, when they were four, there were all these conversations about like what's going on, the police and the lines and the hotel. And, you know, we've been talking about um, cannabis for a long time. And, uh, you know, what I've sort of come to find is it feels like it, it, it's like a dime a dozen these days. It's like wherever we go, like my kids are like, oh, it's another cannabis shop. And we walk into downtown Florence all the time. We walk to the library, we walk to the bike shop, we walk to Tandem, we walk to Pi Bar. Um, and I am in full support of the sort of diversity of our community and who lives here and the variety of interests. And also as a clinician working with young adults, I have sort of clinically seen the sort of the ease and the dismissiveness with which um, uh, many young people sort of utilize uh, marijuana. And um, I think I'm really concerned just about the normalization of um, cannabis in our community um, with the sort of the, the, the number uh, and easy access of cannabis. So, you know, for the 12 years I've lived in this area, um, the main intersection in downtown Florence has been known as like pizza, you know, like pizza corner at the pizza intersection. And I would really hate for it to become the cannabis corner. So if setting a cap is um, what the council has the power to do, then I think as just a community member, a community member who's involved in the community, who likes the community, who supports the community, and um, also has three young children, first grade, two and third grade. Um, I, yeah, I would, no, I would just stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> We have Ananda Lennox. Hi, sorry, I'm just trying to lower my hand to unmute myself and turn on video while keeping my cat off the keyboard. So um, I just wanted to thank you. Um, so I live in Ward 7. Um, thank you for um, having this kind of exploration around how different sectors of the community feel about cannabis. Um, I I uh, used to um, run the Northampton Prevention Coalition. I now work out of the area, um, but I'm still a resident and I'm raising teenagers here, one preteen. And um, I think when, I mean, I can only speak for myself and, and I think I'm a little more informed than maybe the average person since I've worked in prevention for so long, but I know that I was pro decriminalization. I thought that having a legal place to buy pot um, would probably not be such a bad thing for the community. And I was really surprised when Northampton didn't consider caps. Like I just was like, I know we have a limited number of liquor licenses. I know alcohol is a problem, believe me, I do this work. And um, you know, we, we're always doing trainings and trying to get alcohol retailers to do the right thing. And I think for the most part they try to, but alcohol is definitely has issues. 
But I guess what I'm frustrated with about the marijuana growth and how quickly it seems to be happening in Northampton is that um, to me, it feels like now we have a lot of liquor stores and now we have a lot of pot shops and, and it doesn't feel better to me. This doesn't feel like an improvement. Um, if anything, if we could go back in time and have less alcohol retailers, that to me would feel better rather than saying we need just as many pot shops so that would be fair. Because I'm, I'm always looking at this through the lens of it is getting really normalized. And, um, you know, I, I don't want people who use pot to have a stigma by any means, but I don't want my kids to go like, that's what I'm going to do next. Like, I, I really don't. And I certainly spend a lot of time talking to them. So, so I'm pro caps. I, um, I look forward to the conversation and thank you for having this meeting. Thank you. Uh, Michael Willers. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Give me one second. Okay. So first of all, I want to thank you counselors for the hard and I know often thankless work that you all do to sustain and improve our beautiful town and for the chance to talk with you today. So my name is Michael Willers. I'm a resident of Florence and I'm a pediatric cardiologist. I see patients from across New England and New York, but most of my patients come from Western Massachusetts and a very large number come from Northampton. I'm speaking today to encourage you to cap the number of cannabis shops in our town. There are four main reasons to do so, to preserve and enhance the character of our town, to protect children and those in recovery, to pay heed to the voices of the residents and electorates, electorate of Northampton. So first of all, Northampton used to be a town known for its visual performing and culinary arts. People from all over Western Mass came to see our town, came to our town to see theater and dance and music, to visit the art galleries, to eat at the restaurants. But now our town has changed and it's really known among others as the pot capital. And uh, truly we are the laughing stock of Western Massachusetts. We're no longer known for our art and theater and music. Stores and restaurants are leaving town. Storefronts lie empty. And what seems clear to me is that landlords are raising rent, hoping that cannabis stores who can afford the high rent will move in and therefore preventing other merchants like restaurants and other stores from doing so. Secondly, I've been seeing patients, children and young adults in this area for 12 years. Since the legalization of cannabis and the sprouting up seemingly overnight, as mushrooms might do, of pot shops in our town, I have seen a definitive increase in the prevalence of addiction to marijuana among children and young adults. Now, those who are the mouthpieces of the highly profitable cannabis industry, which really is the new tobacco industry just under different guise, they will try to tell you that marijuana is not addictive and that it is safe. That's a lie. Scientific research and clinical experience will tell us otherwise. And we know that addiction is dangerous. It leads to school and social problems and marijuana leads to health issues. For example, I know of students at Northampton High who go to school high every single day. And without that, they feel like they cannot function. I have seen many teens in my practice who struggle with addiction to marijuana. They come in with palpitations, fainting, anxiety attacks, and withdrawal symptoms. Just recently, a paper came out published by the Journal of the American College of Cardiology linking marijuana use with cardiac arrhythmia, that is, Heart, heart rhythm problems. And emerging research has shown us that smoking marijuana actually leads to the exact same cardiopulmonary problems that we see in people who smoke tobacco. Kids from JFK Middle School, even that young, have been found to be using marijuana regularly. And just the other day, I was speaking with a friend of mine who's a pediatric emergency medicine doctor at Bay State, and he has been seeing little kids come in having overdosed with marijuana having found their parents' gummies. And if that's not marketing to kids, I don't know what is, because it seems like candy to them. And they eat it and they arrest and they need to be intubated, placed on a ventilator, and it requires a stay in the pediatric intensive care unit. So marijuana is not harmless to children. Lizzie and Ananda have both spoken very eloquently about the dangers of cannabis shops to those in recovery. And I don't have anything to add except for this that we, the citizens of Northampton, owe it to this vulnerable population to support them in whatever way we can. Finally, if nothing else, the vast majority of Northampton residents, if the public meetings and private conversations are to be believed, do not want any more pot shops. In fact, most of us want far less. It's really a shame this conversation was not had earlier because I have no doubt that our townspeople would have desperately called for a cap for far less than 12 shops and would have done so with great vim and vigor. I don't think that any who voted to legalize cannabis would have foreseen that we would have 12 or more shops in our 
little town. And they would have not have wished for such an overpowering deluge crowding out all the other stores and venues in our town. Therefore, in summary, I urge you counselors to listen to the concern of the vast majority of Northampton residents rather than to the money of the greedy and profitable cannabis industry. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Next we have Adrian. Hmm. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh. Okay, that's a tough commentary to follow, but it really sums it up. I can only speak as a lay person and a, a very concerned grandparent who um, has a young adult grandchild with um, mental health concerns and who um, came across or whatever, and I'm sure it was their choice, but a gummy that sent them into a horrible psychotic event. It was terrible. And so in addition to that, and as a lay person, as someone who lived in an urban area for many years, wasn't raised in one, but lived in one as an adult, I, I am just so anxiety ridden at the incidents and the uh, uh, just pot shops on every corner. It's like um, an influx into a very peaceful, idyllic, whatever um, environment. Northampton is definitely a city now. It's not the country town. I always thought of it as having been. It's definitely a city. But I just hate to see what I see happening in this influx of, of um, uh, cannabis, the industry. And I dread the kind of um, appropriation of what I might call, and I'm not trying to be insulting, but kind of a naive innocence on the part of a community that has been safe and a trusting place to be and a trusting place to raise children to being um, um, snuck up on by people who may not have the, the best interests of the communities and the people who have lived here and who live here. So um, I may be kind of blathering, but I'm just a cap, please, enough already. 12 shops within a five mile radius, come on. And the other towns around, come on. I, and you only see two cars in these humongous parking lots. I, what is this? And what is it a front for is my um, um, cynical concern. So anyway, I rest my case, but I really hope that a cap will be imposed. It's really scary what I see happening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Annie Duran. Hi, thank you. Um, appreciate hosting this also and hearing from other people. I don't have much to add to this to the discussion. So brief um, that um, you know, I was in support of legalizing marijuana. I still think it's okay. You know, I stand by that. However, I also believe that there really should be a cap. Um, in Northampton. I'm a mother of a to-be kindergartner next year. Um, and the overpopulation really does also scare me for so many of the reasons that have already been mentioned. Um, and, um, you know, one of the fears maybe that hasn't been mentioned, but it's something to consider is, um, the overpopulation of, of the cannabis shops right now, the potential um, coming of cannabis cafes and combining with that with alcohol and the road conditions, the drunk driving, the high driving, all those things with our children to walk around the streets and we'll be driving. And, you know, th so that's one other <laughs> consideration for, for having a cap. Um, thanks, that's all I got. 
Uh, next we have uh, Batya. Hi, sorry, actually, oh, let's see if my camera comes on. I hope so. My spouse is actually Batya Cohen, um, who is a physician, uh, ER doctor. And uh, my name is Nikki Hamer. And actually um, what Michael said, I, I've heard reiterated time and time again, um, marijuana is not benign, but it was pushed through um, the legislation as if it is one of the more benign things and that it does not have all of these other extenuating circumstances that exist. Of course, you know, the criminalization is something that was important, but that has, I think, more to do with the writing of the laws and how the laws themselves are written um, and how laws need to be rewritten as far as that's concerned. Um, we are a community of 28,000 and we have 12 marijuana shops in Rising. There is no reason why we should not have a cap or a moratorium um, because where are we going to stop? I, I've heard people say, well, market forces will take out some. And like Anne was saying, yes, you see these, these beautiful Scandinavian-like stores with two and three people in the parking lot, and except for Netta. Um, but still, it underscores um, kind of a ridiculousness. We, we talk about um, how this town is a paradise town. Well, now it's become a pot town. And um, for some people, I completely understand that. But the fact that we cannot stop and take a look at what it's doing our, to our communities and what the people really want instead of what those with money and more influence want is, is pretty shameful. Um, it's okay to say there's a cap. You know, we're not taking away things. We're saying, okay, let's halt. Let's, there is enough here. Um, we have communities that are very nearby. You can, uh, just going up the highway and down the highway, you see bulletin board after bulletin board, cannabis, cannabis. And then you see cannabis, seltzer water. You see all these type of different plays on something that seems kind of out of control. You know, let's step back. Let's see where we are. Let's put a cap on it. Let people know that, you know, the town is concerned. You know, the town has an image that I think we would like to preserve and we would like to evolve as a friendly town, but that doesn't necessarily mean um, a pot paradise. Um, so I certainly hope that we can come together and um, have more of these committee meetings and understandings that 12 is enough. You know, even if we had signs up, even if we had what have you, 12 is enough. You know, we really don't need to be enveloped by so much pot, you know, because where does it stop, you know? And who gets to tell us where it stops, which is usually people outside of our community um, and not part of our community. And I look around downtown and it's kind of funny because all of these very, you know, prideful pot shops with all their frosted windows, you know, which I always thought is very interesting. And I know it has to do with privacy and rightly so. But, and then next door, I see all of these other shops that are just vacant and have sat vacant, you know, exactly what he was saying because of the exorbitant amount of rent and what companies can afford it right now. But what happens also when some of these um, pot shops go decide that our community is not giving them what it is they want to receive, they will up and leave, you know, leaving these buildings as is to create more vacant spaces. So I just really hope that we, you know, can come together. Everything everyone has said is logical, is reasonable, is incredibly justified. And I think we need to cap it at 12. And I, that's really all I have to say. Thank you so much. It looks like we have reached the end of the general public comment. And thank you everyone for your comments and for speaking your mind. Um, I am going to use my powers as chair to kind of move some things around. 
I know that we have uh, a number of people who are part of the roundtable who might have to leave. And I also know that we have uh, Javier from the ACLU here. And uh, before we get into the roundtable, I would like to move up item, let me pull it up. Item seven, because items refer to the committee, which is a three year review of chapter 290, article one, use of face recognition systems by municipal agencies, officers and employees. Uh, for some background, this was adopted 12-19-2019 by the Northampton City Council with provision for three-year review. It has been referred to city services, community resources, and legislative matters on 3-3-2022. It was discussed at a joint city services legislative matters committee, um, with no action taken, and city services continued the discussion uh, with no vote taken, but consensus reached to recommend no change at the time, but to change provision for a initial three-year review to a regular three-year review. With that being said, I will open the floor to Javier. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Perry. Uh, thanks for the New Hampshire City Council to, for having me tonight. Um, we, uh, we have, as you said, we have uh, attended uh, several meetings of the uh, committees of the City Council to talk about the three-year review of the facial surveillance uh, ordinance that was passed in 2019 with uh, the sponsorship by uh, Councillor Dwight, uh, then Councillor Gina Luis Shara and Councillor uh, Lisa Klein. Um, we, and most of, uh, Councillor Perry, you were there too in several of those meetings that we have had in the last couple of months. And uh, certainly the recommendation that we're coming down as ACLU is to not to change the ordinance. In some point was talk about adding a provision to have it come back every three years to the city council. But for review, uh, we talked a little more with former councilor uh, Bill Dwight and at the end he felt that was fine coming uh, for review one time. It set up, uh, tiresome if you if you if you start getting into the habit of having to revisit every single ordinance every single time uh the reality is that the numbers that we presented to the city council when we passed this such as you know mit research that shows that uh physical revenge technology misclassified black women up to 35 percent of the time and that sort of constant even with black and brown males but that hasn't changed right the technology is still extremely biased and what we have seen across the board, it's uh, it's wrongfully, people extremely wrongfully being detained and arrested by the police. We saw that in Michigan, in New Jersey, with people spending up to from 30 hours in detention to 10 days in jail, uh, being misclassified and misidentified by Festus Reveals. Um, Right now, we came, we're coming out from the uh, legislative session that in July, and uh, we were able to move uh, an amended version of the bill that we passed during the policing bill like, uh, two years ago. Um, we were able to take it out of committee in the house. We were able to move it to the floor through uh, one of our main sponsors, Rep, Rep Orlando Ramos, uh, the House voted favorable, but uh, the Senate didn't act upon. So we're hoping that in the next late, late decision, we're going to come back. And one of the reasons why we're coming back is because we want to make the law stronger. And one of the main points that we're talking about is the fact that right now, how, is the, how the law is, how the regulation is in Massachusetts, is there is a lack of uh, the requirement of, of a judicial warrant. And we think that's sort of the cornerstone uh, that in the threshold for any agency in the state of Massachusetts to have to fulfill for them to be able to have access to this technology. If, uh, Councilor Perry, if you wanna, if you have any questions, I'm here uh, to answer any, any, anything. Thank you, Javier, for that kind of brief overview. I personally have been through a number of your presentations. I think that other counselors here uh, have also been through these presentations. So if there's anyone who has not, they have a question. Um, I, I will like to say that 
I'm very proud that this original legislation was so strong. Um, I was pleased to hear that uh, it was written in a way that it will stand the test of time. Uh, and it is kind of a, a model for other cities. So that being said, do any other councilors have a question? I don't see any, oh, right, uh, Council Mayor. I just, uh, mo most more a comment. Um, yes, thank you so much, Javier. And that, um, my, my, the lingering question for me was the review process and how often we should do that. So you address that immediately. Uh, I mean, the thing is, you know, council can always decide to review something. So that's, I think, I think you're, I, you know, I think you're right about um, not having to have a, you know, a, a triggered review that we can, as in fact, it might be more responsive as technology evolves, as all sorts of things evolve, surveillance evolves, we might want to do it more often or, you know, in different intervals. So thank you for that. That's exactly what I was wondering about. Uh, thank you so much, Council Mayor. Um, and I want to mention, we had passed this in Somerville, Boston, Springfield, East Hampton, uh, most of the time with the support of the police, the, of the local police department. Uh, in the case of Northampton, when we passed it originally at the end of uh, 2019, the, the city council passed it and then and, well, unanimously and also uh, what was passed by the city council was supported by the full administration of and then Mayor Narkowitz. So, uh, and it was, I think was a, a specific that process that created what Councilor Perry is saying, a pretty strong and, and a straightforward woodiness that, that the, the city council passed. I think with that, I would look for, Laura, do we need a, a, a recommendation? It that was one? formally referred, so normally there would be a recommendation. So I, I, I'm looking for a motion for a recommendation from uh, someone. Council Jared. I uh, move that we, I'm not sure if it's a positive recommendation or not, but uh, that we recommend that no change to the ordinance at this time um, and no further automatic review. I'd second that. Second. All right, so it looks like it was a uh, motion was made by Councilor Jarrett and seconded by Councilor Elkins, closely followed by Councilor Maori. Uh, Laura, would you take a roll call? Oh, you're muted. Councilor Perry. Yes. Councilor Elkins. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Mayori. Yes. All right, well, that moves forward to the General City Council. Thank you again, Javier, for all of the times you have talked about this. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much, Councilor Perry. Thank you, everybody. All right, I am going to continue to move around a little bit because um, I know that Sue Stubbs from ServiceNet has to leave for another meeting, we are all very busy. Um, so I would like to move towards the roundtable discussion unless any other counselor has an issue with that. No, no we're okay. Um, before we get this started, I do want to say again that this discussion here is part of a broader discussion that is going to be had throughout different subcommittees for the city council. Um, we will be having a discussion in, our, in the city services. I know that I believe Legislative Matters has may have something coming up and is there something in finances? Yeah. So this will be discussed over, over a course of a number of subcommittees. Uh, the purpose, again, is not to discuss just a cap or just one dispensary. It is a view to look at the impact over these last four years in the community uh, to have a discussion. And here in Community Resources, I have chosen to uh, invite folks both from the cannabis industry and also the mental health uh, industry as well. Uh, this, this is the first. I will say that it might not be the last uh, discussion we have. This is a very uh, robust conversation to be had. So uh, with that being said, we have four speakers tonight. The first I would like to introduce is Sue Stubbs, who is the CEO, President of ServiceNet, and she has a, a brief introduction to say. So Sue. Hi, thank you. And I am going to have to leave, but another colleague of mine, Amy Timmons, is here, and she is, go uh, she is going to answer any questions that 
um, might need to be answered, or any questions people have about service, about what I'm going to say. So I uh, interviewed actually um, the director of our outpatient clinic and the person who oversees our addiction services here in Northampton and a couple of the other therapists that work with people with addiction to answer the questions that Garrick um, asked me to address, which is, is there, have we seen an impact on people who have addiction issues in our clinic um, in Northampton? And what they uh, said, all of them, is that um, they pointed out the cannabis was readily available prior to legalization and that many of the people they work with were already had, there was pretty free access to cannabis um, be prior to legalization, prior to all the dispensaries. And this kind of surprised me. I don't work directly with the individuals with issues like this anymore, but um, that they said that um, their clientele generally are not uh, even frequenting the dispensaries because they're too expensive. And apparently um, the cannabis that they can buy outside of the legal channels are um, still much cheaper. And they are mostly, many of these individuals are low income people and they can't even afford to, to so this may explain why they haven't really seen any uptick in addiction issues or problems. Although we have seen um, a lot of issues um, surface since the pandemic. Um, there's a lot more mental health challenges that people have been facing, but they didn't see anything, any connection with the dispensaries. Um, one of them also pointed out, and this is something that um, is a relatively new thing in this country, but there are uh, people who self-medicate with cannabis and who now have, who have in the past self-medicated and now have prescriptions for medical marijuana, which um, actually can be a harm reduction um, strategy and it can be uh, help people get off of heroin and other harder drugs. So that has been one of the positives. I know most of what's being talked about tonight are the negatives. Um, it was also pointed out by my staff that there, that the alcohol addiction problem is actually larger in our community than the cannabis and that we have 93 liquor licenses here. So uh, we're, we're a far cry from that and that people in general that I talk to are assuming that most of the, or many of these dispensaries will, will sort of weed themselves out and not um, exist after a while. No pun intended with that. <laughs> so, um, and it just so happens that there is a dispensary right next door to our, that opened fairly recently right next door to our clinic on Pleasant Street. And the director of that clinic who's there every day, she said she never saw a client of ours go in there. And in fact, she never saw anybody go in there, which is kind of interesting. Um, and one of the arguments I thought I'd just point out that one of the arguments that I read in the newspaper when I was uh, reading about the, the various previous meetings that happened with um, people from Florence is that one of the issues that was pointed out was that um, the proposed location for the dispensary in Florence is too close to the CSO facility that's um, around the corner from there or down the, uh, further on Route 9. And uh, I couldn't help but remember that the community tried to prevent that from going into Florence very vigorously. They had a big struggle, CSO, when they wanted to open that uh, mental health facility in Florence. So. Um, it's kind of ironic that now it's being used as a reason not to put a dispensary when that was something they didn't want either. So, I, you know, in summary, uh, I just, um, you know, want to say that my, my staff have not noticed any particular negative impact on our clientele. And not to say that there aren't negatives and, you know, that certain things about our community hasn't changed because of dispensaries, but as far as in direct impact on um, the clients that we serve at ServiceNet, um, nobody has really reported any big uptick in problems or changes because of dispensaries. So thank you. And I'm going to log off, but Amy is here if people have any questions about what I've said or about ServiceNet. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for your time. And, and I, I do have some questions. I'll ask Amy uh, while you're going, but thank you for okay. sticking around longer. Uh, okay. And thank you, Garrick, for inviting me. And um, Good. Perfect. Um, just to move things along, uh, I see that Volkan Holotol is here. Uh, he was invited as a member of the cannabis community. 
but he is also the owner of Molino's and the 41 Strong Building. He owned Bishop's Lounge for a while, and I brought him in just to discuss what it has been like to be a member of the cannabis community coming in, uh, especially after having experience as a restaurateur in this area. So, Volkan, if you want to kind of... Yep. Hi, folks. How are you? Um, you guys can hear me, right? Good. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for um, all of you being here. Uh, this is definitely an important conversation to have. Um, I've been involved in cannabis industry for three years now. Um, I kind of all started with uh, uh, when, um, you know, obviously you all know Annetta came to town and um, uh, we saw uptick in our um, um, interest in different style of retails uh, from a business, business perspective anyway. And um, we saw that there was opportunity to uh, perhaps um, improve um, the town with uh, maybe new uh, uh, business, business deeds. And um, the, uh, Northampton uh, approved no cap back then. Um, I think it was a community um, uh, meetings that went on and, um, and they decided that they were gonna have no caps in the in this community, which uh, um, that's what that's where all these licenses kind of applied and um, uh, went in. Now, um, none of these there's 12 licenses in Northampton right now, and I'm not sure if there's a few more pending, but um, none of these places um, got licensed six months ago, so to speak, you know, no, nobody, nobody uh, went in six months ago and said, you know what, let me just open a cannabis shop. Um, the, all these places that um, opened literally took three to four years. Um, and um, this three to four years of time was pretty difficult. Um, uh, you had to go through so many compliances, regulations, inspections, um, I mean, uh, the amount of uh, paperwork, amount of um, um, uh, checks and balances that we had to do with the state, uh, uh, with the city, and to make sure that we are completely compliant in every way, shape or form, uh, so that we can be as safe as, uh, safe as we can be in every way, shape or form. Um, the products that we sell is, um, they're all, tested within state. They are all grown within the state. They are all manufacturers within state. And uh, state has the highest uh, uh, testing um, uh, regulations within um, North America, as far as I know. Um, and um, every product that we sell has to be child proof. It has to be CR. Uh, every customer that walks in our store has to be um, checked and recorded um, for their ID purposes. Uh, we need to make sure that everybody that walks inside a store has to be 21 or older, as you probably already know. Um, it, is, um, it is not easy to open these places up by all means. It's, um, it's not like opening a restaurant or a burger joint or a, another bar. Um, probably opening another bar is way easier than opening another dispensary or, or a liquor store, even though liquor stores are limited. Um, so that's being said, back then, three, four years ago, when everybody kind of saw uh, how Neta was doing, um, you know, that kind of like a light bulb went up on everybody's minds, I guess, in, in, a, in a business sense where, you know, everybody thought that, you know, they were going to open these stores, frankly, you know, open the door and buy the jet the next day. Um, you know, it turns out that wasn't the case at all. Um, everybody knows it now that, you know, market kind of settled itself out. And um, um, it is, you have to be very, how do I put this in a nicer way, um, non-business person to open another dispensary. Um, you, it, it just, it just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, a lot of people already said it that you, you know, they see these places and 
there is only one car in the parking lot or two people inside. And, um, and it, it is true. And it, it, these, because it's such a regulated market, um, anybody that walks into any, dis, any of these dispensaries, um, uh, first of all, they're, you know, obviously products are expensive. They have to have the money to buy it. Um, you know, if, um, it, it, mo most of the people that comes in honesty buys it either for, um, uh, you know, pleasure of smoking or, uh, to replace something that they were on before. I've seen it firsthand that a lot of people that comes, uh, a lot of older, that older people, matter of fact, that comes that were on some sort of, um, you know, some sort of psychiatric medication that they, this, this thing helped for them to get off, uh, some sort of, uh, antidepressants that, um, they were taking and this, this thing helped them. They, they got off, they had a sleeping issue. They were all kinds of medications and now they don't have to use any of that. Um, I've, I've seen it in firsthand that it really did help people. And it's more medicated related reasons than, oh, let's, you know, buy a bunch of weed and go in the corner and let's have fun. Um, so that's being said, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I understand the reasoning why everybody's um, somewhat afraid of more being opening up, but I mean, it's already 12 in the city. Um, you know, I wish this was, this conversation was had five years ago or six years ago, whenever this thing was uh, being talked about with the host, um, with the community. And, um, you know, it would have been nicer back then if we kept it back then. Uh, but at this point, I think the market is already keeping, um, capping itself out, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm not here to, um, you know, say cap it or don't cap it. I just wanted to be here. I, uh, uh, Garrick uh, told me to come on to kind of give my opinion of and give you guys the in, inside information on how day-to-day -day, uh, operation goes in these dispensaries. It's, it's, it's very strict. It's, we're very regulated. Uh, we have inspections constantly and we have to, uh, you know, do our um, um, it, uh, in, internal operation in a, such a tedious way that uh, we cannot even be missing one uh, product. I mean, it's, it's as ridiculous as if something falls on the floor, we have to pick it up, literally wave it to the camera and, you know, uh, place a note on it and, um, and let the state know that this was, you know, if it fell on the floor. And I'm talking about stuff that, you know, it's in the boxes, you know, nothing that um, live product. And it's, it's, it's a very uh, tedious places. And, you know, you all went into uh, maybe one or two of them. If you haven't, I encourage you to go in. Uh, a lot of these owners, um, yes, there is big MSOs. Neta is a big MSO. Um, I think there's a couple other ones that are big MSOs, but um, uh, they don't. They literally spent millions of dollars um, trying to get these opened up, and um, uh, they, uh, from the inventory, um, each store probably is carrying two to three hundred thousand dollars worth of stuff uh, that they need to sell. Um, they have payroll that they uh, uh, they need to pay. They need to, you know, the rents and um, um, and the list just it's just a mile mile long so it's uh you know it's i guess what i'm trying to say is it's not easy to open these places and it's not easy to operate these places um and there's a lot of checks and balances along the way um and you know if you're considering a cap sure but we just you know want you guys to know that there's already 12 and i think there's a couple of more pending if i'm maybe i'm wrong um, but, uh, uh, I wish, I just wish that this was done a few years back, not now, but, um, uh, I wouldn't, um, be worried about dispensaries itself. They are very well, um, ran, all, uh, uh, ran, uh, businesses, uh, all around. Um, like I said, the state have their hands in it from, um, A to Z. Um, so it's a very controlled, it's, it's almost like a pharmacy, honestly, it's, uh, you know, you go to your pharmacy, you know, it, uh, you know, they have your, uh, prescription. They know who bought that prescription. They know where it's going. It's, it's literally the same thing. It's, it's, it's a pharmacy, but it's a little bit more, 
non-pharmaceutical look, I guess, because uh, everybody's trying to make it look like a nice, inviting atmosphere for you to when you come in, so you're not afraid of it. You're not, um, uh, you, you don't feel, um, um, what's the word? You're, you're more comfortable, I guess. And um, there's a lot of people that they're just literally just curious that they just walk in and they just want to see the product and and just just look at it and see how how is this even real that you know this this was sold on the street and I used to buy it on the street but now it's in a it's in a I have actually one of the jars that it's empty but it's in a jar and it's CR proof and it's tested you know what's in it you know the THC levels in it you know uh, the cannabinoid profile that's in it um, you know if it's safe for you you know when it's going to expire um, you don't have that in the black market and I I. You know, I, I'm a bar operator for uh, you know 15 years. Um, I can tell you from firsthand, black market is still alive and well. And even though you know everybody's looking at it as 12 dispensaries, and if you go to neighboring towns, I mean, we're looking at I don't know, I'm not sure, 20, 30 dispensaries all around nearby us. Um, still, black market runs 60 to 70 percent of the cannabis sales. And that is a fact. So um, whether you cap it, whether you shut it down, the the market is uh, is still going to be there. Um, uh, and I'll, to be honest with you, rather have these places um, regulated by the state and the towns, perhaps, and um, and give you the right quality product that is fully controlled. And um, so that you you know that you're getting the or the person whoever wants to buy it get, is getting the uh, uh, right stuff for for their needs and the uh, uh, quality stuff for their needs and um, correct stuff for their needs whatever their needs are um, and um, also the town gets a little piece on the side too which obviously they did and that goes a long way uh, but. Um, you know, overall, uh, it's dispensaries aren't easy to operate. They're not, um, you know, other than few, they're literally individual uh, investors that kind of few friends got together. I know them all. Um, and they, you know, like I said, it's a joke in, in cannabis industry. You know, everybody thought that we were going to buy jets the next day. But uh, that's obviously not the case. So it's literally a good old uh, retail business that everybody's trying to um, be a little better than the next and um, competition always makes people better, uh, make, makes our uh, businesses better. Um, but obviously the decision is yours. Um, I hope this information helped a little. Thank you very much. Thank you, Volkan, for that. Um, next, I would like to invite Heather Moore here and Spiffy. Oh yeah, there you are. Hey. Uh, Spiffy has been doing a very extensive data collection on youth substance use, and I know that they have a presentation, so uh, I'll open the floor to you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. I'm going to pass it over to Caroline Johnson to present um, some of the data first, and then I'll follow up with a few other public health comments and so on. Just give me one second here. Okay, can everyone see my screen and hear me? Okay. Great, okay. Uh, so thank you for having us here tonight. Um, we have heard a lot of different opinions and anecdotes so far. And now I'd like to offer something a little bit different and that is data and research on the topic. So I want to start off with an observation my colleagues and I have made. And that is as justification for uh, more cannabis shops, people, people often highlight how many alcohol retailers exist. And at the exact same time, they point out all of the social problems alcohol use causes in their attempt to promote cannabis. So it seems like we can all agree, at least implicitly, that there is a link between the number of retailers in a community, substance use, and negative consequences. 
And today I'm gonna to highlight some research that speaks precisely to this point, And I hope conveys the message that the number of cannabis retailers right here in Northampton has implications for youth. But before that, I'm gonna back up a little and talk about why we care about youth cannabis use. And we care about it because it's harmful. Science shows that adolescent cannabis use affects brain development and sets the stage for addiction, social, emotional, and economic problems later in life. And at the end of this presentation, I have um, a list of references for all of the statements that support all of the statements I'm making, if anyone's interested. So looking at some Massachusetts data, uh, Spiffy has been in touch with the Massachusetts Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, and we have received data from them that shows that cannabis is by far the most common primary drug at admission among 12 to 17 year old youth who receive inpatient treatment for substance use. And I wanna point out here that this has gone up eight percentage points since legalization. And I'm not talking about 2021 here because of um, potential pandemic effects, but even still across the board, it's the, the number one reason young people are, are going into treatment. Spiffy has also been in touch with our lo local poison control and we obtained some data from them that shows a very steep incline in the number of calls for cannabis-related poisonings among, among Massachusetts children and teens. For instance, um, there was a 240% increase in the number of calls to poison control for cannabis exposures among, among six to 19-year-olds in Massachusetts from before to after adult use cannabis retailers opened. And I don't have the chart on this slide here, but I'm happy to present it to anyone who wants to see it. If you look at edibles specifically, so calls to poison control for edibles, there was a 20 fold increase in the number of calls to poison control for this same age group. And I wanna point out here, people can call poison control for all sorts of reasons. They can call simply to get information. They can also call for exposures. And the data we have shows that when people are calling about cannabis, they're calling about exposures. So then looking at some local data, some, some local youth survey data we have right here in Hampshire County and Northampton spe specifically, 40% of Northampton middle and high school students who've used cannabis report that they've experienced acute negative consequences as a result of use. So this can range from things like extreme uh, confusion or anxiety, having a really fast heart rate, um, or hallucinating, uh, even feeling nauseous or vomiting. We also have some data that looks at driving under the influence. Again, youth survey data. And Northampton youth are 10 times more likely to drive under the influence of cannabis versus under the influence of alcohol. And they're twice as likely to get in the car with someone who had been uh, with a driver who had been uh, using cannabis versus alcohol. Last, I just wanna point out Spiffy has um, talked with local pediatric physicians and these physicians have noted a rise in the prevalence of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome in their patients, which is very consistent with um, national headlines we're seeing on the topic. So we care about youth cannabis use because it's harmful. It hurts youth, it hurts families, it hurts communities. So then the question becomes, is there a relationship between how many adult use cannabis retailers youth live by and their likelihood of using cannabis? And before I answer that question, I wanna acknowledge that there's a difference between per capita retailer density and how close people actually live to, uh, to storefronts. So there can be the same per capita retailer density as I've drawn out here in this slide, but a very big difference in visibility and how close people in reality live to a retailer. So you can see these in these, in these two images here, it's the same density, but a very, very different situations. 
there, there are very different proximities here to these to these stores. And I think when we're talking about what's going on in Northampton with adult use retailers, this is something that we need to keep in mind when we hear different statistics about density. It's not necessarily about per capita density, it's also about proximity. So getting back to this question, um, is there a relationship between how many cannabis retailers there are, how many cannabis retailers youth live by, and their likelihood of using cannabis? And the data and the evidence suggest yes. So academic research consistently shows that the closer youth and young adults live to outlets where any sort of substance is sold, alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, the more likely they are not only to use, but also to use more heavily. And we've conducted some, some analyses here using local data. And we've demonstrated that the same relationship that is being found in academic research also exists right here in Hampshire County. So the more adult use cannabis retailers, middle and high school students report are within a 10 minute drive of where they live, the greater their own 30 day cannabis use. And these analyses are controlling for sociodemographics that may predict cannabis use. So um, for instance, controlling for, so for socioeconomic status or um, grade level. So all else being equal, the more, the more retailers youth report living by, the more they're using. And we can also look at our data in a slightly different way, and we still find the same thing. So if we look at 30-day use rates and edible use rates among youth who report using cannabis, both of these things are higher among students in, in Hampshire County districts where there are five or more adult use retailers versus in districts where there are fewer than five retailers. So you can see here, um, the school districts with five or more retailers are in blue, school districts with fewer than five are in orange. And you know, I think it goes without saying here that Northampton is included in, in those blue bars right there. So given that there, the research shows that there is a re relationship between the number of retailers that youth live near and whether, and, and whether or not they're using and how much they're using, why might this be? What can explain that link between the number of retailers and whether or not youth are using? And I think there are two pathways. I think there is a direct pathway via increasing access. And there is also a more indirect pathway via shifting norms. And I think the second pathway where, where retailers are shifting norms is a potentially more pernicious pathway because it's changing the way we think about things. It's changing how our community feels. And, um, and in so doing, it's facilitating use among youth. So we have some data that speak to these two pathways. Related to this direct pathway, again, this is using our local youth survey data. data. The percent of youth who report being inside a cannabis retailer is almost double in Northampton compared to countywide. And I wanna point out if you're looking at this bar chart here, as of 2019, only 1% 1 of all Massachusetts residents have medical marijuana cards. So medical marijuana cards can't account for this difference here. Something else is going on. Another data point that's relevant to this pathway is that 40% of Northampton middle and high school students who use cannabis report that the cannabis they're using comes from licensed retailers. So the more retailers there are, the greater the access. It's a pretty direct link. And again, this is something that's been showed not only in the cannabis literature, but looking in the alcohol literature, the tobacco literature, we know that this is the case. And then in terms of this more indirect pathway, we have some measures of shifting norms over time. So we ask students about um, their perceptions of, parent, of their parents' disapproval of their own cannabis use. And what we can see is that over time, it's dropped. So it's dropped 12.5 percentage points uh, 
compared to pre-legalization back in 2015. And if you look between 2021 and 2022, you can see the steepest decline there, which just so happens to, to align with when a, a large number of retailers opened in Northampton. And the reason why parent disapproval matters is because believe it or not, parent what kids think about their parents and their parents' approval or disapproval predicts whether or not they're going to use substances. So as parent disapproval is going down, we can expect that over time youth use is gonna go up. Another thing we're seeing right here in Northampton is related to youth risk perceptions about cannabis. So when you look at the percent of youth who think there is moderate or great risk associated with using cannabis once or twice a week, you can also see that that's dropped over time. It's down 7.3 percentage points compared to pre-legalization. And just as, the case, as is the case with parent disapproval, risk perceptions also predict whether or not and the extent to which youth use. So given the demonstrable role of parent disapproval and youth risk perceptions on actual youth, or on actual use, sorry, um, coupled with what I was talking about related to this direct pathway via increased access, the data are telling a pretty straightforward story about where youth cannabis use is headed in the wake of multiple retailer openings here in Northampton. And speaking to this point, if you ask, oops, sorry, um, if, you, if you ask youth about uh, where they live, over one in four Northampton students report living within a 10 minute drive of at least six cannabis retailers and almost three quarters report living within a 10 minute drive of at least one retailer. So given what I've been talking about, the data I've been presenting, the research I've been presenting, I think these results right here are cause for concern about rates of youth cannabis use in the coming years, especially the in the past two years, so many retail shops have opened. So I wanna end with a few comments from local members of our community that were taken from some focus groups and key informant interviews that Spiffy recently conducted this past spring. And I think they bring the data that I've been talking about to life and they illustrate that there are very real concerns about the impact of the sheer volume of cannabis retailers on youth in Northampton. So one uh, parent who participated in a focus group, I believe her son goes to Northampton High School, said, I voted for legalization. I definitely was behind it, but I've had more questions since then. And definitely watching my kid, I'm like, whoa. And I have other friends who are like how I feel, kind of bad I voted for legalization. Uh, a school resource officer, so a police officer, and I have to say this, this school resource officer is not located in, in Northampton. They are located in a neighboring town. They said, uh, our kids are bringing products in the building from local dispensaries, and I have a drawer full of them. I can show you. It's just no big deal to kids. And then last, Another focus group parent said, we have pot shops on every corner in this town. There should be some kind of government intervention to protect the kids from that. So based on the data, the number of retailers matter and caps matter. Voters voted for a regulated market and one element of that is caps. And I hope the data I shared today shed some light on the relationship between the number of retailers right here in Northampton and what that means for our youth over time. And here's a list of references that I'm sure are very hard for everyone to see right now. Um, my colleague Heather and I are printing out um, uh, this presentation and we're gonna put it in every city council members mailbox, uh, I, hopefully tomorrow morning. Um, and we are happy to take questions. And again, thank you for having us here today. Thank you, Carolyn, for that presentation. Uh, Heather, did you say you had something to add to that or?
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I don't have a, a whole lot to add. I think Caroline really tried to speak succinctly about the issue of caps as opposed to a lot more broad public health issues. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Heather Warner. I am the manager of the Spiffy Coalition, which is the strategic planning initiative for families and youth. Um, and I work with Caroline and um, others. And we're a countywide uh, coalition in Hampshire County. Um, and originally, the Northampton Prevention Coalition was actually a task force of SPIPI. And I've been there for many years. And I've been in the prevention world for about 30 years. Um, so um, I guess I, I just wanted to um, respond a little bit to, I mean, this question about like why you know, why, why do we cap the number of cannabis shops from a public health perspective? Um, and, you know, even as we talk about the impacts of the number of retail cannabis shops on our communities, we also need to realize that many have just recently opened and we really have a lot more to learn about what future impacts will be. So we're only at the very beginning of this. Um, we also know that, you know, the cannabis industry is like the alcohol industry and tobacco industry, we're talking about a, con a controlled substance and that's different than any ordinary commodity. So, um, you know, we control these, these things, you know, so that we can have quality control and so that we can, you know, keep uh, the products out of the hands of young people. And, you know, there's many reasons why we regulate these types of commodities differently than we do a dress shop or um, a chocolate shop or you know other industries. And so when I hear people say you know that caps, why would we have a cap on you know this industry when we don't on others? And it's that you don't necessarily the market the the, the market forces um, which you know can when you have no cap might lead to increased competition can actually have a negative um, influence when you're talking about a controlled substance. So, you know, it, you may have, you, you know, it could lead to cutting corners, it could lead to hiring staff that's less qualified, it can lead to basically um, seeking out younger markets. Um, you know, the business model for tobacco and alcohol are that they need heavy users and lifetime users. That's the model. And I'm not, you know, so convinced that the model isn't very similar for cannabis. So I guess just a few other points. Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I did want to respond that I was here before city council in 2018. We did ask for caps in 2018. This much of the same, you know, we we had even less data about, um, you know, sort of the impact of um, cannabis on, uh, you know, our communities back then. And um, in listening to some of the remarks on that 2018 recording, it, um, you know, I, I think at that time, city councilors said that they thought that the industry would plateau at about five or six shops. So, you know, I think taking a guess at where we may plateau now, um, you know, is, uh, you know, could be risky too. I, I don't know, you know, where this industry is headed, but I do also know that, um, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And so while it may take, you know, millions to start up an industry, it's also they're changing hands, you know, and we saw that in the first year, Netta was sold to, you know, um, a national multi, you know, multinational corporation. So, you know, there is, there's big money at stake. And, you know, when that's the case, I think it's even more reason why, you know, caps are important in terms of, you know, part of our, our regulatory system. So with alcohol, um, well, the World, Horth, sorry, the World Health Organization um, says that there are three top ways to control excessive alcohol use and youth use. And those are pricing, availability, and advertising. So these are the same factors that can be directly related to cannabis and to capping, you know, the need for capping. Because, um, you know, again, when we have a glut of shops or stores in, in a region, 
um, you know, then then you start to have, you know, price pricing can get lowered, which it increased youth access. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean that youth are purchasing it at the stores, but it means that they can ask, access the products more easily on their sort of underground youth market, which is actually a really huge piece of the alcohol industry's profit share is underage youth. And so while, you know, while we don't, you know, shops may not want that to have those customers, they benefit from them. And again, the other thing that the World Health Organization says is availability. And so again, you know, when we have a, a lot of shops in one community and they're all competing for the same, you know, markets, there there may be a more of a inclination to um, go for younger markets. And you know, again, maybe we we know that young people have incredible ID ability to get fake IDs now that pass right through scanners. So we don't know what it will look like if business practices do become a little more, um, you know, like they might be more willing to take risks in how they're how they're doing businesses. We might not have seen that yet, but we really the 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 we really haven't seen what it's like to have twelve or fifteen shops competing in in this market. We haven't gotten there quite yet over time. Um, and again, with um, advertising, you know, it's like this is there are so many industries now that have to compete for advertising space. And that includes a lot of the places where young people um, can see this advertising. Um, and again, like Caroline pointed out, that's a lot of that social norming, which then can really increase both population use and youth use. So, I mean, there's so much more that I can say, and I, I don't want to. Um, you know, I want to leave time for people to ask questions. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there, but I'm I'm happy to answer questions too if, if people have questions. Thank you, Heather, for that. Uh, last up, we have Ezra, who is. Uh, a cannabis consultant. He's worked with a number of businesses here in Northampton and outside, not just dispensaries, but as well as production. And uh, he has been intimately involved uh, as an advocate. And I will open the floor up to him to just present. And then uh, there you go, Ezra. Thanks, Councilor Carr. Uh, thumbs up if everyone can hear me. <clears throat> um, so, Let's see, I don't really want to get into uh, relitigating the law. Um, in 2016, uh, Massachusetts legalized marijuana for adult use. In 2012, uh, a decade ago, they legalized it for medical patients. And I think um, a lot of locals uh, and, and people across the strait and, and the 145 million people across the US who have access to legal cannabis uh, realized that part of the problem was that it's already here and it's already accessible. Um, Northampton is a great place. It's actually famous uh, for its legacy growers. Uh, the, the access to cannabis is obvious from those of us uh, within the industry. Um, my perspective is less um, one-sided. I guess I'm very aware of the harms. I'm very aware of dangers. I'm very aware of um, effects on the brain. Um, what I'm interested in is sort of a 20 year outlook moving forward. Um, a good example that, that I wasn't aware of um, it, it, at all, just because I don't do anything in the alcohol industry, but uh, Mayor Narkowitz, before he left, said that he regretted uh, capping liquor licenses. Now, um, I, I would also agree that we should probably cap liquor licenses. How many liquor licenses do we need? What if more liquor means more kids use? Well, it also does mean economy. Um, when Dr. Um, Willers mentioned art, theater, and music, um, a lot of that economy in Northampton that Northampton has been famous for uh, thrives in an env environment, whether you're at an art opening and there's alcohol, whether you're uh, at a restaurant listening to jazz and there's alcohol, 
Um, I'm saying this not from the perspective of see how bad alcohol is, we need more weed. I'm saying um, that is what drives people to uh, come to Northampton, to go to restaurants, to uh, listen to live music. So uh, the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, in conjunction with the Department of Public Health, has allowed uh, kids to walk by shops. It, they've allowed uh, cannabis to be grown at home where kids are. There's no stipulation as to kids and growing, producing your own cannabis. So basically what we've determined in the state is it's here to stay. Um, even uh, people mentioning uh, some of these super old school um, uh, statements on, on marijuana are, are talking about a cap of 12. I, I mean, imagine that 20, 30 years ago, uh, people would think you're all insane. Um, but I think you all get it. Uh, it is here. There are going to be shops here. They're regulated. They bring people to this community. There's three in Northampton, there's 150,000 people there. So, I mean, in Springfield, excuse me. So, and what we have coming uh, in 2023 are social consumption, uh, lounges, cafes, um, areas where you can go, uh, consume cannabis and drive away. Um, they are the cannabis equivalent to, to bars. How, if, if we brought Mar uh, Marinarkowitz in here and said, you know, how would you sustain? How would you uh, make sure that the economy of, of Northampton was going? Would you uh, lift the cap on liquor licenses? Would that allow more restaurants to open, et cetera? Um, would you put cap on cannabis? Would that stop the economy or would it allow it, the market to expand and, and utilize this? Um, these, these cafes are going to bring people. Um, it's going to be a destination. Um, so, I understand um, the perspective of, of fear. Um, I, I've heard uh, only people who only know and research the negatives uh, about cannabis. Um, I assume people uh, who are speaking in opposition uh, often are, are not around the culture, um, not around uh, people who, who consume it. So if you think more in the sense of it is here, um, how do we develop an economy in this town? Uh, we have brought alcohol into this town as of 1937. Um, it has harms, um, but we would all be really disappointed if none of the restaurants had alcohol <clears throat> um, and there were no package stores. So we've been allowed to have it normalized in our communities, despite the harms. And we have to figure out how are restaurants going to stay here? How are the little ones that we love um, that might be more about passion and less about economy uh, or, or just volume, how are those going to survive? And that is Mayor Narkowitz's uh, argument. He's essentially saying, uh, or he, he understood, and this is exactly what happens in the cannabis in industry. So I'm trying to be as unbiased as I can because I, I don't want to influence, um, you know, based on me being in the cannabis industry um, you know, I'm not going to inundate anyone with, with propaganda here, but um, this is what happens to a market where a license uh, is capped, and that is it creates a secondary market. I'm sure you've all heard about it with, with liquor. Um, a liquor license can be sold, and if you have a, a municipality where it's limited, uh, those liquor licenses become more value, valuable. As the value goes up, those who can participate in that market um, have to be wealthier. Uh, they have to have, um, you know, a, a bigger stockpile of, of funds. Uh, they, that is what is going to create um, uh, the sort of corporate or um, non-local people uh, uh, coming in to, to a city. Um, all, every single retail, every single license in Springfield has already sold to a larger uh, company before the comp it's even opened because the HCAs, the host agreement, uh, are so rare in that town. So it, the same thing is going to happen with uh, cannabis. Uh, you lock down the number. Um, those who have licenses who aren't making uh, enough money, maybe they're just making enough money to, to survive you know, middle class, if all of a sudden somebody says, I'll give you a million dollars for your host agreement, great, they'll sell to one of these corporations. Um, 
it, it, that is what markets do. Um, and therefore what's gonna happen is all of the local people who uh, are passionate about the industry, who may have been some of these famous uh, growers over the last many decades, um, they'll lose out, right? And giant MSOs will come in um, or stay in here. And then you'll be stuck with a culture of people who um, when these products are going out to kids, or if there is an issue with increased kids use, it just goes up the chain of command uh, to some, you know, owner in LA or China or wherever they are. And they say, well, what are the rules? What are the laws? Do we have to do anything? Are we required to help that community, to help the children in that community? Nope, we're not required, uh, but it is an issue and people are complaining about it. Well, that's not what the market is is creating. So, um, if so, if we're talking about a specific location that we do not like, if this uh, euphorium, the proposed shop on the Four Corners in Florence, is this tipping point of uh, acceptance, uh, the community, even people who voted for it, are like, that's enough. Um, I'm not sure that capping, uh, certainly capping, um, from the perspective of, of those of spoke here is based on a very uh, limited under understanding of what the market is doing and where it will go. Um, and uh, a special permit process is a very simple way. Uh, if special permits were required for retail, as they are in probably 99% of all communities in Massachusetts, um, the Euphorium uh, shop would never pass because it has to be in harmony and reading about it, you know, that the the shop itself has to be in harmony with the with the local vibe of the of that region it's in. So uh, the planning board would say, sorry, there's too many people complaining about this. You really can't prove that you're um, in harmony uh, with this little uh, uh, section of town. And so we don't vote that, that you can open. That's a simple way to do it that still allows the industry and the economy to grow around this. When we're talking about theater, music, art. We are not talking about baby boomers. We are not talking about people like me who are almost 50 years old. We are talking about young people. Young people drink alcohol, they consume uh, cannabis. I am talking about 21 to 40 years old. That is how these economies uh, of, of um, culture and art uh, are sustained by young people. And I went to art school. <laughs> there was plenty of cannabis there. Um, so I would encourage um, everyone, especially the people who are looking at data that only confirms the bias they already have, to uh, think about it on a much longer time scale. Um, you know, every day I read three or four articles about cannabis. The one I just read today is that, uh, they've done a scientific study and uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, get a 10 billion loss for every legalization event. So every time there is a massive legalization in a state, um, any change in um, from medical to legalization, pharmaceutical companies are losing money because people replace cannabis with their sleep aid, with uh, their uh, opiate with other things that are more expensive, that have stronger side effects, et cetera. So my perspective being in the industry is not, oh my goodness, you know, we don't have the data in from these five shops that just opened. I'm sure it's gonna be horrible. Let's make weed illegal again. I'm thinking, hmm, it's here. It's going to be legalized federally uh, pretty soon. And so how are we going to make it sustainable? How do we educate our children? People come to me, right? I'm always surprised that they don't go to their doctors. Parents who are worried about their children smoking too much are rarely talking to medical professionals because they're not educated about it. I don't want to talk to parents about how to, I know how to do it, I can speak to them, but in 20 years, 30 years, we will have so much more education. Um, that's part of why I'm here and why I've asked to be here is because I love this town. My kids were born at home in Florence, uh, and I am going to usher cannabis into this town as safely as I can, but with education, because it's here. It was already here, and now it's here in a regulated fashion. So how do we do that in a long-term way that doesn't uh, equal 
you know, this mayor or the next mayor or the following mayor saying, wow, I really wish we wouldn't have capped uh, licenses because our uh, theater, our arts, our uh, music scene is decreasing because the young people are going elsewhere where the communities are more progressive and, and welcoming. And um, if, if anyone wants uh, uh, more uh, by unbiased data um, as to uh, how to read the, the data that was presented, I'm also happy to do that. I'm not gonna get into it now, but um, if anybody just felt like that was kind of some old school um, Nancy Reagan uh, tactics, then I, I'm happy to pr present some um, more balanced uh, data on that. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Ezra. I was going to, well, it was open up for a round table with questions from the counselors, but it looks like Carolyn has a hand up. Carolyn. The person who was presenting it, to which I think as commenting, I would just like to point out um, my background is that I have social psychology which is a, a field very closely related to public health. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. It seems like I might be freezing a little. Am I good? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I'm just gonna turn off my video just in case. Um, but my background is in, in research and understanding research at a comprehensive level, not to present my own bias and bring that to the discussion, my point today in presenting the research was to show what's going on in Northampton. And I think in public health, we have to show that the scientific benefits to society outweigh the cost to the public's health of doing something. And I'd love for Ezra to maybe comment on some peer reviewed medical literature that speaks to how the health benefits outweigh the costs, particularly related to two caps. Uh, uh, let's see. So I, I don't want to go into a debate. Hold on, one, I, one I, yeah. Yeah. One go ahead. Sorry, sorry about this. Uh, I, I was distracted. I apologize. I am at work and just apparently sprung a leak. There is a, a huge thunderstorm here in Holyoke, uh, and water is pouring through the top. Uh, but I do see that Councillor Elkins has her hand raised. So, Councillor Elkins. Well, Councillor Perry, if you uh, Garrick, if you need to take a a break. I can hold my question until after if you need to deal right. with something. That would that would be great. Can we just, uh, Laura? Can we just take a, a five minute so I can see where the water is coming down into the merge area? I apologize to everyone. Thank you for being patient.
folks, I'm just going to pop on uh, to say that um, I am, oh, actually, uh, Councilor Perry is, is calling me right now. So hang on just one moment. Okay, so uh, Councillor Perry was trying to reach me. Um, I'm vice chair of uh, of the committee, so it, we're going to give it just a just a second, so I can see if I hear a word from Garrick about when he, if he can get back on. But if he's uh, detained for very much longer, we'll just we'll resume, um, and I'll I'll step into the chair seat until he can be back. So sit tight for like, let's give it two more minutes, uh, and I will. Uh, be be back on when you see my video come back on that's that'll be the cue All right, it looks like Councillor Perry is going to be uh, detained for a few minutes more. There's apparently water pouring in uh, <laughs> to his uh, place of employment, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, so I'll go ahead and call us back to order um, to continue the, the conversation. And just so you guys know the timeline, let's see, it's 725. Um, I will leave it open for, account, uh, for committee questions um, for a couple more minutes, make sure everybody um, on the committee has had a chance if they have any questions. And then um, uh, we will have a, a brief public uh, period for some more public questions uh, and, and, and back and forth with our presenters and anybody from the public who has, has questions. I will, pro I will set a time limit on that uh, part of the discussion, just in light of how, how long it's, we've already gone um but i'll say what that is uh after after the counselors have had a chance to ask questions um i was um when we broke i had um i had raised my hand uh for a question for our last presenter and also i guess also to eric uh to ezra um which also kind of piggybacks on carolyn's uh response to his remarks i guess my thought if ezra's back um is that uh i would echo carolyn's question or response this is your opportunity to present um so if there is um if there is other data or information that you wish to present that you wish for us to consider or for the public to know um it's not something to be shared after the meeting it's 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 here so uh so, so we'll come back to that question. The other thing I wanted, um, so I'll give you a chance, Ezra, to reply to that. But the, um, the other thing is um, that uh, it was mentioned that uh, Mayor Narkowitz had suggested that that he that there was some sort of city legislation or action that uh, caused the cap, that was the result of the cap on liquor licenses. I just as a point of clarification, that's not the case. Um, we have. Um, had um, caps on liquor licenses that's controlled at the state level and always has been. Um, and I I do think I've recalled conversations with uh, Mayor Narkowitz uh, and I wouldn't want to speak for him, but 
he's he certainly lamented the caps and their effect on uh, the market and on our food scene, but uh, he he could not have said that he uh, regretted having passed cap because he didn't have anything to do with that. Um, that's passed at state level. So with that said, um, I ask if, if Ezra, if you have a thought uh, response, I'm happy to hear it. Um, uh, to, so I, I will, um, if, if, so are we only presenting data which affects whether to cap or not to cap? Is that what we're trying to do? Like you don't want to hear other data. This is only about capping. I just want to be clear here. It's the first time I've been to the community resources meeting, so. I, this, is, this is uh, this is sort of an open sort of roundtable, and and I, I just uh, I I'd like to, and I, and I also going forward, if we can limit the presenters from any from sort of back and forth, and let not let this devolve into a, a sure. question back and forth um, between presenters, but I. Uh, answered, I, I popped up, my hands uh, went up um, with similar question to Carolyn, not, I'm not asking in response to that. I, I, I my response was uh, to your suggestion that you had uh, other information or data. Um, and I, I guess I'm just curious to know why that wouldn't be shared with us or, or couldn't be made available um, now or form formally. Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it's less, um, it's less about, so part, Part of the issue, I think, is the lack of data. Um, this has been happening for decades, which is this idea that we haven't, we found some harms of cannabis, um, and so we we shouldn't legalize it. Um, th there's a huge disparity between the federal and, you know, on a federal level. So the entire federal U.S. government says it's a dangerous drug with no medical benefits. Uh, there's 145 million people in the U.S. who have access to medical marijuana. So um, and use it for all different sorts of things. So there's a disparity there. There's also been on the federal level research. I mean, Spiffy is funded uh, not to come up with uh, you know balanced information about cannabis because it exists. The whole purpose of anyone who is trying to find the harms of cannabis to kids is they're only going to look for harms. I mean, looking at some of the data in Caroline's slides. I mean, the first one that seems I, I would love to see and we have we can get real data because we have video surveillance uh, of every single second of every single store in the city. So, Caroline, you mentioned that 21 percent of uh, adolescents uh, surveyed have been inside of a cannabis dispensary. So I, I, I we're not going to have a, actually I'm going to stop. We're not going to have a back and forth between the presenters. That wasn't my question. It, you, if you're citing lack of data, you seem to be suggesting that you had that you had data or that you had other um, sources or reports or studies um, that presented a different view. So what I'm asking is, can can we have those? Do you have those? Can you make? Can you give us sites? Can you make that available? Uh, yeah, so uh, the, the, this is, uh, I, I cannot present data that uh, shows that, I mean, should, sh can I present data that shows that kids have not been inside retails? I mean, the burden of proof is on the person who says children are inside re uh, retails. Um, you know, I, I bet 20% of adults who live in Northampton have not been inside just, retail. So I, I don't mean to interrupt, but the, the, I, I think her, what I think what I understood it to mean is that of a survey of, of young people that they self reported having been inside. Um, so uh, it, please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's, it's. And, this, and just to be clear, yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not debating anything. I just want to be clear. The data point is 12% not not 21. Okay. Um, as, as someone in the industry who actually makes sure these are compliant and goes through inspections, um, th that's an insane statistic. I would be absolutely shocked if kids were ever inside uh, of any retail. Um, I, I, I'm not, I, the, so I'm not really interested in trying to argue, uh, against caps. Um, knock yourselves out. Um, I am saying that uh, these arguments that um, there's, there appears to be ways in which you can look at data 
that points to it being harmful for children, which are the same data points that were presented before legalization. So we legalized uh, and cannabis is still available to children. Um, they <laughs> feel free to cap uh, retails or ban them or reverse or take the law away. Um, absolutely. Um, there is a lot. Anybody in the industry would acknowledge there are a lot of retails. Um, I guess what I'm trying to bring uh, from the industry and from my knowledge of cannabis, um, also my knowledge of kids and cannabis, because kids come to me. They don't go to people who have one view of cannabis. So they come to me and I speak with them and they have access to it. So how, if we cap the retails at 12 or 10 or 50 or whatever it is, they will still be here. So according to Caroline's data, there's gonna be uh, products inside, you know, full, filling the drawers of principal's offices. What do we do about that? How does our community use its resources in this roundtable to make sure that we have information that can help the youth? Okay. I think we all went to these programs where they said, drugs are bad, don't use them. Um, or uh, you know, the visibility of cannabis shops increases uh, uh, adolescent use, um, disregarding that social media and uh, pop culture is, uh, has ubiquitous uh, uh, cannabis. So how do you possibly control for that? Every teenager I know has a device that they look at constantly and they're scrolling. And so are these shops actually increasing use in, in Northampton. Uh, uh, there's data that Northampton youth use more than other towns. Well, of course, we're a progressive community. No, I'm, not, I'm gonna stop you. I feel like you, I, I, so I just because, you know, it, it's, it's, we're getting late in the day, I wanna make sure that um, other, uh, the counselors have an opportunity um, if they have other uh, questions. Yes, Rachel. Hi, I actually had a question for Volkan, if he's still here. I don't know if he's... Volkan, are you still with us? I guess not. Well, Mike, I'll just let the counselors know. Yes, I'm still oh, here. Oh, thank you. No, no, I'm still here. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, uh, sorry. So I, just, I wanted to just kind of yeah. uh, be cl clear on what I think your point, your point. I mean, I guess I would say, ask you, what, what do you imagine the impact of capping now would be on existing uh, cannabis retail. I have an assumption that on some level that would uh, be, you know, welcome or would secure their business. But I want to, you know, I would like to hear from someone. It also sounded like you were saying you feel like it's redundant at the market. I, I know that you're saying that. So maybe you think it will have no impact. But I'm, I'm concerned about the businesses we do have here in Northampton and what, what the impact would be on those. I mean, it, it's tough to say, you know, it's at, at this point um, we have, you know, the upper 12 dispensers, they're, they're live and functioning and, um, you know, adding another one, is that going to make any difference? I, I personally don't think so. Um, will that make a difference in that particular community that it's in? Maybe. Um, like from business pers business perspective, you're asking, right? Yeah, I'm just um, looking, I know I, we're switching gears here, but I'm really just trying to think. Yeah, from, from, a, from, to from a purely if... if yeah, I mean, if, if we're talking just, you know, pure math perspective, um, I don't think it's going to make any much difference, honestly, at this point. Now, if, you, if it opens 10 more, now that's, that's a different story, you know. Um, one more, two more, I, I, at this point, now that we're 12, uh, you know, if we were having this discussion when it was five, six, then I would tell you 100%, we cap it now. But at this point, I don't think it's going to make any difference. Not, not, in a, not in a major way anyway. Obviously, no one wants so many competition. Uh, but 
uh, you know, I'm a, also a restaurant owner myself and we, you know, deal with uh, 60 different restaurants um, all around us. And in my eyes, being in the food and beverage industry for many years, more the merrier. And I mean that from bottom of my heart, because uh, that's, that's why you'll see Dunkin' uh, um, uh, Burger King right next to uh, McDonald's or, uh, you know, right next to Taco Bell. It just draws more people in. That's why, you know, it's uh, uh, Stop and Shop is near Big Y or, um, you know, the, you know, Applebee's is right across from Olive Garden or whatever have you. So, it okay, just creates a hub. Um, yeah. So you're saying that having some existing stores encourages new stores. Is that correct? I know this is Say it again, you got cut off. I'm really sorry. looking at Excuse me. Having um, yeah, I, I could I couldn't understand. Can you say oh, I said so. I were you saying that having existing stores, the more existing stores we have, the more it will encourage new stores to open. Is that what you were saying? Not. I mean, uh, no. That 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 one because there's always going to be, um, you know, uh, math is going to play at the end, right? Yeah. Because these are so massively. Um, it, look, even this person, uh, I'm assuming this person is trying to open in Florence. By the time he opens, it's two years. Two years. You guys are looking at two years. He's not going to open in a year. He's not going to open in a year and a half. Two years. Easy. By the time he goes through this regulation, by the time he goes to inspections, by the time he has to buy his um, uh, you know, stock, by the time he gets this up and running, your grand opening day is two years from now, even if you guys said yes to everything right now. So right. you know how much stress he's going to go through in that two years of time and uh, the money that he has to dump to carry the leases, the electric bills and the uh, ac uh, account bills and um, uh, uh, lawyers and uh, consultants and never mind the CCC approval uh, papers. And I mean, uh, just our yearly fee is ten thousand dollars just just to state never mind the city and the right. list goes on and on and on so, so Volkan, you also um, said i'm just trying to clarify what you said and i was afraid you were going to leave that's why i asked this business question first i have of course other things but so you're also yeah. saying that that businesses that come in now now that we do have so many uh have 12 to you know 14 13 um that you don't think uh, you you implied that they they yep. probably wouldn't be great business you know folks to come in into this market so then you're talking about future um potential cannabis owners here being you know less uh more more volatile you know more um less secure of a business meaning they'll go out of business more often i think we're um, I mean, I can't speak for every business yeah, owner that's going to open future cannabis shop, obviously, but, but, but we're already, but we're already, yeah, but we're already in that realm already. Okay. You don't even have to open another one. We're already in. It. Okay. Thank so you very much. I just yeah, wanted to make that, sure I, mean, I that, that's, your, your but you understand that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's every industry that you understand that, right? It's, um, it's not just cannabis, you know, any, any industry that you, you know, the market opens up and the, the industry grows up and there is going to be, uh, you know, uppers and downers. So that's every industry. That's how kind of business shapes, shapes itself, if that makes any sense. Yes. Thank you very much. Yep. I, I just want to state that I'm back for the time being. Thank you guys for your patience. Uh, the statement when it rains it pours is very much in effect in my life right now um and, and thank you for councillor elkins for taking over and i'm sorry that i missed out in some of this conversation but Councillor jared i see you have a question great thank you yeah i have a question for the folks from spiffy um so you talked about density versus proximity uh are you aware or do you have any recommendation about an ability for um, the to regulate the distance between real tip real re retailers, and do you have any suggestions about that or recommendations? I can start to answer that, and then Heather, I don't know if you're going to want to chime in at all. 
the primary reason I brought that up is because in the research um, that I was talking about related to um, the number of retailers in a community and how that has an impact on youth use, that's not looking at um, like per capita rates of density. That's looking at um, geographical proximity to storefronts. And so that was my primary purpose in bringing that up. And so as a put, so I can't quite, I can't fully answer your question other than to say that that I just wanted to be sure that I was being precise in how I was defining what we were, what we meant by density and proximity and being close to storefronts. Um, Heather, I don't know if you want to add anything onto that. I mean, I guess only that, you know, sometimes there's a comparison between like the Berkshires and it's like, oh, this, you know, there's higher density in the Berkshire, but that may be because there's two shops and a lot lower population over a much larger geographic area. But when, when research is done on density, a lot of times it's a single neighborhood or, you know, it's like you, you want to look at what's going on, you know, in proximity to the establishments a lot of times. So um, I guess that's, I don't know if that answers your question. And I think you had a question about, or actually, do you want to clarify your question again? I mean, and I can find out this information elsewhere if you don't know it, but do we have the ability to regulate the distance? Oh, between? Right, the yeah, I mean, I think that's a zoning issue and it's certainly something to think about, you know, like, you know, I don't know. I mean, it would that would be different than a capping issue. It would be, Right now, Northampton has zoned it exactly like any retailer, which is why we were kind of impressing that this isn't just any retail establishment. It has other consequences to it. But I know that Northampton reduced their, their uh, buffer zone around, for example, schools and places where youth congregate from 500 feet to 200 feet. And that's something that we should probably look at because I don't think any um, retailers have opened any closer than 500 feet, but then why take the chance? Let's change that now. And a lot of these rule setting, this is what you have to think about is like, we, you have to be a little preemptive about it. You know, like let's go slow while we're learning the impacts and not just, you know, once you set the, you know, the, the rules, it's so hard to undo them afterward. And, and just to point out that it's, you know, it's, you know, we, it is a small, small and lower funded public health that's trying to, you know, talk about some of these issues against a very big lobby and a very big industry. So there's a lot of power behind, you know, once you start to go down that road with certain types of regulations that are unchecked, then it's really hard to go backward. So I think our time is now. Um. Second question, uh, you said that the data suggests, and I wondered, uh, you know, I know where you're gonna send us links to those studies, but does that data come from other states experience, which had, you know, longer time of, of recreational use, or is it just the last few years in Massachusetts? That's exactly right. So um, you'll see some of, some of the references are related to what's happened in, Oregon, and then uh, there are some other studies looking at uh, Los Angeles County, um, and there may there may be another study in there related to Washington State as well. So it's it's not just specific to Massachusetts. Great, thanks. And last question: um, How would you suggest setting a number based on data that that you're you know based on data essentially? You know, if we're going to consider a number. Uh, to cap, then how do we, how would we go about determining what that number should be? Sorry. Um, there are, yeah, there are formulas for like understanding density and outlet density for alcohol. Um, there's several different models that we can pass along. Some are more complicated than others. Um, I don't know that they actually then provide recommendations for density because um, I think they mostly point out what, you know, sort of the, some of the local consequences can be, whether it's related to sometimes crime in the case of, you know, alcohol outlets or, um, you know, business practices, sales to youth and that kind of thing, or just use use rates and adult use rates. 
that normalizing kind of trend. So I don't think we're going to be able to come up with a number for Northampton. I think we're on new ground. And, you know, what I'm hearing from even the business community is that, you know, geez, we probably should have capped at five or six. And, you know, that there's benefits to that. Now we're here, you know, can we handle a couple more? Because, you know, there maybe, but I think we're, we're sort of at our, you know, at, at a peak. Great, thank you. Garrick is back in charge. I am back in charge. <laughs> Look at that. Thank you. Uh, I missed a few things, so I'm uncertain if other counselors have questions. Did everyone get their questions out? And did uh, some of the other counselors who are not a part of community resources have a chance to speak? If they have questions, I would like to start. I would just caution that, if I may. Go. Mary. Um, that, that the city solicitor has told me that other counselors should only participate to the extent that the public does. Uh, otherwise, there could possibly be an open meeting law concern. So they they are well they should be welcome to participate, but only as much as the um, the public can participate. All right. Well, that's that's great. So then I'll say that, uh, Council Mayor. <clears throat> yeah, just a quick. I'm just looking at my questions uh, for Caroline or Heather. I was just really, it was very interesting to me, the whole parental approval, disapproval paradigm. So uh, that's, so you're saying kind of what happens is indirectly with, the, you know, the, the, the parents are exposed to the stores and it trickles down in this way of approval, disapproval, you know, that that scale, is that basically what you were saying? That, that the way that the stores negatively impact the children is through the, um, in terms of like visibility is in, is that it actually impacts the parents and then that impacts the children? I think it's a little bit of a different story. Yeah. Um, not that that story isn't a story to talk yeah. about. I just thought that was interesting. I, I, I hadn't know, uh, didn't know about that kind of connection of, of approval, disapproval. As a parent of three, I like, to know, I like feeling so powerful. <laughs> it does feel nice. I am also a parent, and I do have to say it does feel nice to read the literature saying that how we feel has an impact on our kids. Yeah. No, I really, I perked up. <laughs> so the, da the data that I'm talking about is telling, it has a slightly different slant on things and this yeah. is looking at students perceptions of their parents approval or disapproval oh interesting and, and this matters arguably more than where parents actually stand on the matter because if because what matters is what young people think and if young people think that their parents are less disapproving they're going to feel like things are more normative and that it's maybe more okay for them to use, which is why when I was talking about sort of those indirect pathways, I'm thinking about the long-term repercussions of, of what it means to be a place where there are a lot of retailers and why exactly the literature shows that there's a relationship between the number of retailers youth report living by and how much they're using. Thank you so much, Carolyn. I'm done. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to bounce off of you, Council Mayor, because uh, I, I, I did not know that that was self-reported, the, the perspective that there was more acceptance. Um, and something that Ezra mentioned was education. And I was wondering if there was data about marijuana education. Do you guys track that? Has there been uh, any noticeable outreach as we opened these facilities uh, to educate parents, to educate uh, youth? Um, I, was, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I'll, I'll turn it over to Heather who has the historical yeah. expertise in this area. I mean, I guess I just would say, you know, that that is one of the roles of prevention coalitions. And, you know, it, it is, a, you know, one of the things that we're fighting for is is simply to have um, health class be a required class in schools, for example, and then figuring out what curriculum is good, including some curriculum that talks about um, 
you know, the war on drugs and, and the negative impacts that that's had, you know, and, and balanced education around this issue so that young people can really understand what's happening, um, you know, as well as understanding how corporate interests influence their decisions as young people and the advertising they're receiving. So I would say yes, with Northampton Prevention Coalition having been in, you know, operation for um, over a decade and, um, you know, one of the things that Kara McLaughlin is working on right now is a whole assessment of how young people are learning and where, you know, even understanding some of the biases and the way that health education is done so that we can, you know, make sure that we're bringing really the best to them. Parent education, we do all the time. Um, you know, those are definitely factors. But what I will say is that, you know, we will never be able to educate our way out of substance use issues. When you look at like um, vaping, uh, nicotine, for example, and the vaping industry, we can't just educate young people to stop vaping. Policy is what has will change youth use. So policy, when you're talking about substances, policy is the most really effective public health approach. You know, and we see that with alcohol, we see it with tobacco, and this is why we're so concerned around some of these policy issues for cannabis. I have a question, um, Heather. Is there data that suggests, because I'm pretty sure that um, Prevention Coalition, um, as I've interacted with them over the years, uh, you know, they, they have, they can only provide um, uh, evidence of harm, uh, th th that there is no, you can't just talk about, you know, how to safely use cannabis, because essentially you're telling kids to use drugs. Um, but yeah, I can address that. I think that's what is being asked here is, mm -hmm. is there, because it, so from my perspective, it amounts to abstinence education. Right. Um, right. And the data on sex so, abstinence yeah. is pretty Yeah, um, I'd be dismal. happy to address that. that yeah, that, that's kind of what I was going to ask next. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, sure. I mean, so with, with prevention efforts, you have a continuum. And, you know, you see this with... Um, sexual activity as well, right? We all debate about how to teach about, you know, sex ed. And what what we see and where some of the divide right now is, is that at the college setting, absolutely the kind of education that young people get is harm reduction. That's what they get, whether it's cannabis harm reduction, alcohol harm reduction, sexual, you know, um, you know, activity, neg you know, negative sexual, abuse type stuff and how do we how do we work with that when you get to high school you have to really um there's a there's a waiting that happens because when you when you if you were to fully embrace harm reduction you also then would be setting a norm for the younger students an expectation that this is a rite of passage and is something that to be expected and so there's a real fine line to walk. And we've been talking about this. We're not just from, like I really was insulted that you talk about Reagan era and war on drugs. That, that's really not how prevention is done these days. And we are really partnering with our harm reduction um, you know, folks in the community and looking at how we can reframe the discussion about um, drugs. And we've, had, we've done a training with young people on specifically on the war on drugs and the impacts as well as looking at how big industry manipulates the markets and you know preys on young people oftentimes you know as part of their market strategy and i'm not saying that that's completely happening right now in in cannabis but it it is a portion of their market whether it's through social access or or whatever and um so lastly, to speak to that, um, it's something that we're still exploring. And, and what I will say is that we also partner with groups like Community Action Youth Programs and Dial Self. And there we have sometimes young people who already are engaging in substances. And with that group, we can safely talk about harm reduction without setting a norm for the many students in a, in a school system that are not using. Thank you. Uh, and, and to Ezra, I was wondering, I know you have a lot of experience dealing with the Cannabis Control Commission um, and you've talked extensively about education. Uh, they are 
working on ways to improve what they what they have done so far in order to make sure that minorities are, are present um, to, to kind of shore up some of the gaps. And I was wondering if you know of any work being done to really focus on this re-education uh, program. I asked this because uh, a number of meetings ago, we had Sean Donovan, who was our interim director of the Department of Community Care. And a lot of what he discussed was before forming uh, you know, his, his team, he wanted to focus on re-educating people about abuse, substance abuse, um, you, know, uh, you know, all those things. And so is, is there something being done on a state level to really address kind of the gap in preparing both parents and students uh, on education? Uh, it's a good question. I, I think the Cannabis Control Commission would say, it's not, not our department, uh, that's up to the Department of Public Health. Um, I think the Cannabis Control Commission, or so the Cannabis Control Commission and the regulations do require education. Uh, th there has to be very specific educational materials in every cannabis store in various languages, in fact. Um, and it's great education, uh, but it is basically the last thing that anybody in a cannabis store um, seems to be promoting to, to any of the consumers because presumably they're getting their information elsewhere or the consumers who are driving the market are already educated about it. Um, and it's something that I find really disappointing. Um, you know, every uh, talk that I see by a scientist or a medical professional, uh, there's, there hasn't been a single talk I've ever been to that's mentioned the endocannabinoid system. So like the most important receptor feedback system in the body, uh, which is named after the cannabis plant. Uh, it's just, it takes five seconds to look that up online. And when I talk to teenagers, they, they share information about that. Oh, you know, this about the endocannabinoid system, I heard about this, or my uncle. Does. So my opinion is um, it's legal. We've legalized it. it we can uh, pretend that, uh, and, and, and sorry, I, I do uh, get frustrated. And Heather, I, I apologize for insulting you. And, and I appreciate um, the work. And, I, and this is a small community. So I, I really am committed to... Um, net benefits. Um, but it does frustrate me when uh, a guy who went to art school is the local expert on the endocannabinoid system. And there is this, um, it's, it's studied by 10% of medical schools. So I just, um, I feel like it is a huge glaring um, uh, lack of education that is harming kids. Because they know people, uh, their parents went to Harvard and smoked tons of weed, and now they're going to go to Harvard and they smoke a couple times a week. How do you convince that kid um, that what they're doing is bad for them? Uh, if you only say, stop doing it, you know, this can hurt your brain. There, I feel like this community is more intelligent and, and deserves a more sophisticated approach. But I profess my own ignorance. I, I am not about to go into schools and say, you know, look at how cool the endocannabinoid system is because it just feels like I'm promoting cannabis. Um, I know that people who are teaching sex ed seem to be able to, uh, you know, educate children in a way that, that, that doesn't seem like they're promoting sex. I mean, maybe a lot of people do, um, but the Cannabis Control Commission wants to educate consumers, uh, that's not really important in the market. I don't know why. Uh, and it's completely lacking in the medical market um, as well. There's all of these rules about you can't talk about medicine because FDA ha has only approved it for um, various things in this country. It's been approved elsewhere. Um, so as a parent of kids in the high school, um, as a parent who does educate my own kids uh, about things like the endocannabinoid system and, and their brain and usage and, and dangers of um, cannabis, I would love to see more of it or some venue uh, where, where that could happen, um, knowing that, and, and that's why I really think this idea of caps is just missing the point. I mean, let's face it, 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 and that's what I've told these meetings when we've had these public meetings. We have a crazy social experiment. 
that is occurring. We have a town of 30,000 people with uh, 11 shops open and 14 shops proposed. I assume that all those shops theoretically are gonna open by the time uh, any cap is put in place. I would say that the cat is out of the bag and I would love to, to see parents and community members uh, take any data you want to um, and then say, now how do we help the kids? How do we help people in recovery? How do we help uh, prevent people or when people have consumed this? Um, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. So when I read data or when I talk to a parent or a, 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 a person who has weaned themselves off more harmful drugs and discover cannabis, I think that seems like a net benefit for that individual. Um, but I understand you, you can't say, oh, well, that, that is, I believe in harm reduction as well. Harm reduction often includes giving people safe access to methadone, uh, giving uh, people access to cannabis as an alternative to opiates. There are some very controversial um, aspects of self-harm. In Europe, they do it. You know, Switzerland has methadone clinics. They give, uh, you know, um, clean needles. But that's a very shocking for, for communities who aren't used to it. Um, as far as cannabis, I do think there is a way of developing harm reduction. Um, I don't see how the debate of caps or some number of how many, when it's rampant in the homes of parents, uh, there's plants, I have two plants growing in my house because I legally can. Uh, it's growing in our homes, it is in the schools, it is in the shops. Um, so I would love to see a, a more um, rigorous Bayesian discussion. Let's take the new evidence that we have. It is legal, it is here kids already know about it and they can research themselves and they don't believe the harm. So with all of that information, now let's come up with data. Let's come up with science. Or uh, community watch groups that are going to make sure that this, you know, section of kids that are in this, uh, uh, you know, region with this ward, are watched um, by adults or are protected in some way. Um, because I think what has, the billions or trillions of dollars that has been sent, spent to prevent kids from um, having access to it, it's just, it's not working and it's not educating anybody. Or I, I say that uh, a little flippantly. I, I appreciate that there is some data that, um, you know, education or, or teaching about uh, prevention can help, uh, but from my perspective and what I see in social media and movies, et cetera, um, it's so rampant that I would love to see um, Bayesian uh, taking the new data we have and then presenting ways to help, not just capping, even though, sure, ca cap it at 12. It's a yeah. huge number of shops. Um, thank you. So Heather, I see you have your hand up. I had a couple questions I, I don't want to, I know this is a, it's a big topic and we can go back and forth forever. So I don't want to kind of devolve into this back and forth. Uh, do you have a, a quick point to make before I go to my next question? All right. Perfect. Yeah, just a quick point, which is just that, um, you know, we were invited here to talk about CAPS today. And, you know, we can bring a lot of information forward about, you know, the education that's happening with young people across the state, um, about what the Department of Public Health is doing, what SPIFI is doing. But we are here today to talk about the value or, you know, whatever with caps. And so I've heard a lot of anecdotal information and, you know, we've been trying to really keep our, you know, presentation to some of the, you know, information that we've gathered, which again is, you know, we survey over, over 2000 students across Hampshire County every two years and, you know, it's, it's, we've done that for a very long time. And it's, it's, I, I just, you know, I, we can talk more about some of the data we collect. Happy to do that. I, I just want to uh, make a point that you were not invited here to talk about CAPS. Um, you're invited here to talk about the impact on youth. 
Um, oh, okay. And if thank you, you. If you look on it, yes. And I say oh, that. Oh, thank you. I actually appreciate that clarification. Yes. We, uh, we, I, we thought it was as it pertains to CAPS. No. Uh, and, and in fact, so we can I, expand I, our. Yes. So I, I stated that at the, at the start of the meeting okay. and actually before this roundtable is so that the, this discussion is a fact finding mission to understand okay. uh, the impact that marijuana establishments have had on our community as a whole. Uh -huh. Hence why okay, I, I didn't uh, frame yeah. this as just a. You know, it's not about one pot shop. It's not about caps. This is actually a chance for us um, as counselors and as a community to understand what is happening in our community. Um, mm -hmm. And that brings me to my next question. And I, I will pose this to uh, both Volkan and Ezra um, and anyone else can, can kind of chime in, but uh, people have noted that one unexpected consequence of the marijuana industry has been single use plastics. Um, the existence of, you know, the tubes for joints. I, I'm uncertain if other people have been into a cannabis dispensary, but I know that Council Maori has been championing um, pulling back our use of plastics. So I was wondering, both Ezra and, and Volkan, how do you feel about some of the rules and limitations that make you utilize plastic and, and how you feel that maybe we as, as a city can help um, curtail some of that use, uh, whether it's through compostable containers or, or whatever. So we'll, we'll talk if you want. And Garrick, um, I'd like to say, I feel like a question was posed to me, but I didn't have a chance to answer it. Oh, okay. What, what, what? Um, you, you posed the question to us. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Uh, you posed the question to us uh, if we had any response to anything Ezra was saying, and I just like to have my response to that. And my response is, um, you know, he was talking about the ubiquitous impact of social media. I'm going to stop my video because I can see my internet's a little shoddy, but he's talking about the the ubiquitous impact of movies and TV and commer in and social media. Uh, on youth use. And I just want to point out as a researcher, unless we have reason to suspect that there, the kids in Northampton are watching movies at higher rates or visiting social media websites at higher rates than their peers in other, in, in other, other areas of Hampshire County, we can, we can say that's kind of background noise. We know that that's having an impact it's scientifically. We know all of that stuff. That's what social science research shows us. And above and beyond that, unless there are systematic differences between groups and between kids in different towns, we can't say, I, I, I don't think it's fair to say that we, that we can't isolate an impact, say, of the number of retailers on youth use. So that, that was just my one comment. Thank you. No, no problem. Thank you. Sorry for skipping over you. Uh, so again, uh, my question is about single-use plastics uh, and their impact in the industry and in the greater city of Northampton. So. Go ahead, Vulcan. Um, for uh, plastic, unfortunately, plastic is the, one of the most used um, containers in the market for any cannabis product. And the reason for that is it's very fluent and flexible. Every cannabis product has to be CR, means child resistant. And uh, any product that you buy, um, there is some sort of strength that you have to apply, kind of like your medication that you buy from um, CVS pharmacy, where um, you know certain age, somehow, some way cannot get into it. Um, obviously, after a certain point, it's uh, responsibility of the parent, I guess. But uh, um, the, the use of plastic is more common is because it's the, the way the plastic, you can form it in any shape and it's easier to make it um, child resistant and it's more stronger. Um, there is uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, you, you'll have products even we'll have some gloss in him and then we'll have another plastic jar around it. On top of that, there'll be another, another uh, um, paper or cardboard box, you know, some stylish presentation uh, box around it. Um, so it's uh, manufacturers and growers go um, a lot of length 
to make these uh, very secure for, um, you know, if, God forbid if um, an adult purchases this and brings it home and just, you know, they, they had a bad day or whatever and they just leave it on the counter. Um, uh, you know, if the child grabs it, they can't just get into it. Um, so plastic is uh, very useful when it comes to that kind of stuff. And, and before you finish, I actually have another question that I, I know that the industry is required to dispose of materials after a certain date. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. When you dispose of that material, uh, I, I don't know if everyone else knows that, so maybe explain that, what happens to unused product. But my question is the containers for the product. Say if you have stuff sitting in your store uh, that has not been touched by a consumer, do you also mm -hmm. have to dispose of the container that it was in? Um, a container, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit more flexible when it comes to container itself. Um, but uh, overall, the product gets a test date for uh, one year. So anything that has an over year, um, once it lets, let's, for instance, we, you know, we made a product today and uh, today was 919th and uh, that product will have a, a one year test date and next year, whether product is good or not, once the test date expires, we no longer can sell that product. Every product that we sell out of dispensary has to have a test date by the state. Now, if you know you couldn't sell it and the product is expired, um, we have to. Uh, there's, I mean, different for each product, but uh, let's, you know, since we're talking about um, containers, you know, let's let's say a pre-roll went bad, we have to take the pre-roll out of the plastic. Um, container, uh, put it in some sort of organic material like coffee grounds, for instance, that's what we use. And we have to literally mix it in a mixer, um, make it unrecognizable and unsmokable and unconsumable, and then throw a dye paint on it. Um, two people have to witness this. And um, then we have to sort in these special bags. And then we have to tag those bags and then we have to put those bags inside another bag. Then we have to go to the um, trash and, you know, camera watching us and actually show it on the camera that the whole process was, um, uh, you know, covered. Um, and the box itself, usually we try to recycle it if this was a um, expired product, but we have to tag all the um, tags out of it. Like, you know, there is a, 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 you know, batching system or metric system or barcoding system that there is that we usually either shredded or, uh, or compost it with the material that we're mixing in it. So it's pretty intense process, even if it's something very small. If it's something big, you get into even bigger uh, deals of um, trying to get rid of this product. And everything has to be um, on camera. You have to have a few witnesses. Everything has to be signed for counted for you have to report it at the end of the night um there's even yearly checks that we have to go through thank you it's literally a fight it's literally a pharmacy guys like that's that's what these are i mean it's uh, some of the you know security systems that we have our security you know company uh literally laughs at it saying that i don't have that in regular pharmacies like it's it's uh it, it's pretty tight operations all around All right. Uh, Chair, Perry, Chair Perry, I did a, a note of um, process note. I, I believe that it sounds like some of the um, um, members of the public who are with us tonight um, are having, are not able to uh, disable, uh, enable their video, excuse me. <laughs> They're not able to, okay. Their video is disabled. Okay. Um, I'm, I will, I was trying to look uh, to see the settings on that, but. I will continue to look. Oh, I, I do see that. Thank, thank you so much. Sure. Um, <laughs> with, with that being said, I, I think I've, I've asked a number of questions. I, this is not going to be my first meeting about marijuana in Northampton. So I have other questions for other committees. Um, you know, I, we did say that there would be a chance for some public comment, but um, I know that a number of people here have already spoken, so I would like to also open it up to some of the city councilors who are here if they have uh, any questions to ask. Um, 
or common. So that will wait. So I have to, they have to have the same access. So I don't want to have it back and forth. So I would like to open it up for any comments that anyone has to make before we close up this portion. I see no counselors with comments. Let us go through these last folks with Kara for a comment. Let's, uh, let's also try to keep them brief. I know that some of us have been here for a long time. It is still pouring rain in my establishment. Uh, so thank you for being understanding and civil. Thank you for um, allowing us to talk. Um, thank, I'm sorry to hear about the rain pouring in your building. That's terrible. Um, my name is Kara McLaughlin. I use she, her pronouns. I'm speaking as a Florence resident and parent of a third grader. I do work for the Department of um, Health and Human Services, and I will be speaking with Merit Commissioner O'Leary in two weeks, but I'm here as a parent. Um, I'm also a prevention specialist, which means I have hundreds of hours of education and training in substance addiction prevention and youth, specifically around youth services. So it's just, I want to just note that we get a lot of training around conflict of interest. And it's very upsetting to me that the marijuana cannabis industry is here to rebut all these comments of public health tonight. That if you wanted to hear about how cannabis is impacting the community, should have invited the community, not the cannabis industry to speak about that. There are plenty of people, there was um, Northampton Area Pediatrics was on this call. They could have been asked to come in and speak. They have an addiction prevention counselor. Um, there's lots of people that could have that come in here. High school teachers like Trish Armstrong, thank you very much for being here. And like Kip Armstrong, for doing such great service in our community and health education. These are the people we should have been hearing from, not people pretending they're environmentalists, not people pretending they're medical doctors or researchers. It's very upsetting to have everything rebutted by cannabis industry. Um, I'll also say that I'm really concerned about the incoming on-premise um, consumption sites, the cafes. So Massachusetts just passed this past August, the ability in the legislature for cannabis to cut cafes to start. And if we're concerned about the dispensary numbers, what is it gonna look like when we have on-site permission? Are they gonna be selling gummies? And um, are they gonna be driving? We don't have ways to test if people are intoxicated. Often people are using alcohol and cannabis. We have no ways to test these things. And by the proximity, um, switching to alcohol density, uh, alcohol density, cannabis, I'm getting tired. Sorry, it's been a very long day. Cannabis density. When I take my child to a strong Ave, there is no way there's not cannabis signs everywhere around us by just the fact that there's stores so close. Jarrett, um, Councilor Jarrett brought up the density of um, zoning, we did not pass, we were very laissez-faire in Northampton around caps and zoning. We're like one of the very few communities that did not set any of these up. And now that's why there's so many densely packed together. And when you bring your child downtown and you see so many stores, it is like advertising and in prevention. We know the more signs children see, the more frequently they see them, the more likely they are to use and form addictions. So this research is very readily be available for alcohol. There's no reason to believe that it's not gonna be true for cannabis. We're starting to see the results in the data that Heather, Heather and, and Caroline painstakingly took found in our data. They're not making this up. I'd also like to encourage you to realize that the data we have was taken during a pandemic and that children did not have as much access as they will be having in the next coming years and to take it slow and steady and we can always open it up more if we feel like this was a mistake. But right now, this is not a mistake to have caution and to see we're seeing an impact on youth and there is no explanation for us as responsible adults not to take that information in and be reasonable. Um, and the last thing um, I wanted to comment on is um, if people are really concerned about health education, they should go to the state and, and demand that we have mandatory health education that is evidence-based, 
in elementary through high school. That's the work that the Northampton Prevention Coalition is doing. We are not focusing on dare. We are not saying just say no. It is very insulting to be told us when we're focusing on equity and centering youth voices and trying to meet the mental health needs of our community. And one of them is when we know that there's more substances and they're normalized, that youth, youth increases and it is dangerous for adolescents to use substances. This is our most precious thing we have in our community as our young people, and we should be treating them that way. Thank you for your time, and I'll stop here. I look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Thanks, if I could ask someone to uh, um, turn on my video, please, because it's one of the ones that's been disabled. I think you should be able, here, I'll ask you. I think you should be able. Oh, I got it now. There we go, yeah. thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so I, I'm gonna, um, sort of echo some of the words that other folks have said, but I think that really need to be pointed out, mainly this issue of bias. So as my grandmother would have said, I don't have a dog in the fight, right? I'm here, my bias is to make sure that, that kids and, and, and teenagers can stay healthy. That's my bias. I'm not making any money from doing this tonight. I don't get, I, I don't get money for, for, like, for trying to protect kids' health in, in situations like this. There's no bias here. The bias is about the science. What does the science say? And, you know, Ezra, I'll, I'll just say, and please feel free to call me Michael. No one calls me Dr. Willers, but my mom. Everyone calls me Michael. The bias is really where the money is. So follow the money to find the bias. The cannabis industry is incredibly profitable, incredibly well-funded. It is the up and coming tobacco industry. And to say that there's the, the, like to call yourself a self-styled expert and say that other people aren't. And, and when the science is very clear, like the science was presented tonight beautifully. And we have to pay attention to that. Otherwise you're like Donald Trump saying, you know, take ivermectin and drink bleach. Don't listen to the scientists. So it's important that we listen to science. It's important that we realize where the bias is really coming from and where the money is going that is, that is, is, is corrupting our town and changing its character and causing absolute harm to our youth. We have to pay attention to that. And we have to realize who the real experts are. And, and, and as has been said, there's a lot more. Like my wife, for example, does trainings for teachers and law enforcement and social workers all over the state and all over New England to talk about, the, the, the talk about cannabis and all sorts of other substances. That's who the experts are, not the ones who, have, who, are, who are getting profit when companies and shops move into our town. Thank you. For the record, I agree that the cannabis industry should not be talking about science or health. Thank you, Ezra. Um, um, only have a few more comments here. So, no, I totally forgot the uh, Sarah, but not Sarah. Yes, David Velez, uh, thank you. Um, first thing, Kara, Michael, thank you, well said, and I couldn't agree more. Um, this has been a fascinating, somewhat infuriating, but fascinating discussion. I know we're gonna have more, and I would just say that I would please encourage the, the council and everyone in government to follow the science, follow the actual experts and, and please give equal weight. It does seem like this discussion has been dominated by the paid pot consultant. And that's unfortunate in my view. I, but that's not here nor there. I, I will share, since we're talking about anecdotal stuff, one quick anecdotal thing. Again, I have two young children, five-year-old daughter. Uh, she you know, does what little kids do that drives parents crazy. We were out in public in Northampton at a park all of a sudden I see her putting something in her mouth. She found some kind of gummy on the ground that she put in her mouth. And we're like, oh God, and we got it from her. And my wife and I joked like, hey, this is Northampton. That could have been a pot gummy. You know, and like, I don't know if we would have said that in another town in Massachusetts, but like, that's now the thing. Like, hey, this is Northampton, there's pot everywhere. That gummy was very well could have been a pot gummy. And I'm, I don't mean to say things inflammatory, and some, but it was a timely anecdote. What I will say, I will focus my comments specifically on the cap. And I know that's not the focus of the meeting, but my understanding and city councilors, correct me if I'm wrong. And again, I am laser focused on the one in Northampton that's being proposed a half a mile from my house. 
is that we, the, uh, there's only two ways, you know, the zoning is non-existent. They're agreed, they're allowed by right. There's only two ways that this euphorium pot shop will not happen in this downtown four corners of my village. And that is one, the mayor decides not to do a host community agreement, which as I understand it is an executive decision that's purely up to the mayor, whatever influences, but you know, that's a totally subjective executive decision or the city council representing the will of the people and you know, the will of the citizens decides to do something. And the only something that I believe is on the table is the cap. As my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong, the only mechanism the city council has to stop you know, this damage and more of this coming, but particularly the one in Florence is to institute a cap. And if that's the case, that is why I'm asking this council to please listen to the voice of the community, everyone you've heard, the scientists, the doctors, the health professionals, and please consider a cap and save our village from, you know, I understand that, you know, the people say the market's going to do its thing and, you know, many businesses will go out of business. That is true. And look at downtown Northampton. I don't want that. I don't want to see another vacant storefront. I don't want to live with the collateral damage until the market does its thing. Let's fix this now and preserve the character of our community now. It's a very nice community. There's a lot of things going for it. Um, let's not ruin it, please. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lori. Thanks. I just, a few points I wanted to make um, in response to some of the things that were said. Nobody's arguing that uh, marijuana isn't or shouldn't be legal right now, but it is not legal for kids and it is harmful to their brains. So I feel like what we're talking about here is how to mitigate the harm that might come to them. Um, it's a fact that it's harmful to their developing brains. And the more um, establishments we have advertising marijuana, the more their the perception of harm to them goes down and, and this feeling of like it's inevitable. As a teenager, we're all going to use it, and that is harmful to their brain. Um, uh, I also wanted to say, I don't even think it's normalization at this point. I think it's romantic, romanticizing marijuana. And the billboards make are, are exactly what happened with, with uh, tobacco. It's like your life is going to get better if you use marijuana. That's So I don't care if adults use it but I don't want teenagers to use it. And I don't, I mostly don't want them to be uh, taught that it, that's how their life is gonna get better. Um, if we, I feel like we didn't learn anything from the tobacco thing. And um, I feel like the other thing I just wanna say is, I mean, there, somebody asked, how do you decide how many? I think there's enough now. There are enough pot shops in our city for all the adults who want to get pot to get it and some people from out of town too. So why do we need more? I just don't see why we need more. Um, and the final thing I'll say is that I feel like there were lots of people talking, spouting anecdotes and opinions. And the only people that gave data and statistics were the people from Spiffy. So thank you, Spiffy. Yeah. Oh, Councillor Elkins. Sorry, I just wanted to 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 jump in quickly and say uh, just address uh, something because I, I know people are suggesting and and want to come back to the to Euphorium and the and this and this the shop in Florence and uh, without issuing any kind of opinion or suggesting that I know what the answer to this question is, I think it's going to be an open question or a question for Attorney Seawald whether or not there is any action that council can take regarding a shop that is already in process. Um, there, are, there are going to be real legal concerns with, um, I think, there are gonna be real legal, legal concerns with um, any action that we could take that could retroactively affect an, an already initiated application. Again, I am not putting a legal theory out there or opinion out there. I do not know what the answer to that is. I, I just, I, I think that 
folks who are advocating for this or thinking that a cap now will be the answer to that particular issue may be disappointed in, in what we learn um, from, from our uh, city councilors, oh, no, city councilors, our, our uh, town from Alan Seawald's opin uh, opinion or thoughts on the matter. Um, so again, I really want to say, I don't know. I haven't researched it. I just, just, you know, please be aware that that is an open question. So. Thank you, Councillor Elkins. Kip, we are only two left. Hi, my name is Kip Armstrong. Um, thanks for the time. Um, it, I'm a uh, licensed independent clinical social worker in town, private practice, been doing addictions work for many, many years. I'm involved with the Prevention Coalition and a number of other things. Um, I would like to point out that this has been an extremely frustrating meeting to sit through. Um, I feel like there's a significant lack of institutional knowledge um, regarding uh, the discussions that are going on. Um, at uh, Vulcan was saying that it's too bad that we didn't press for caps uh, like three to five years ago. Um, and uh, I know Heather pointed it out and indeed I was in front of the um, city council pushing for caps in 2018. What's frustrating about where we are right now and the, and the way that this is going is being approached by you folks is it's like global warming um, where we anticipated what was going to happen and it's happened and this is exactly what we were anticipating in 2018 when we were discussing caps is you know how many do you think we should allow in town and eventually they came up with the idea should be no caps um, and look what's happened and the impact on youth is significant. Um, Dr. Johnson pointed out the, the insidious changing attitudes that are going on. Um, uh, it's, youth is using marijuana. It's, much, it's a very casual thing now. It used to be um, considered sort of differently, and now it's just one of the things available to youth that they go for, and it's getting into their hands from these different distributors. So um, what's frustrating is um that it's being discussed like oh what should we do the cat's out of the bag i think what needs to be done is pretty clear is we need to protect our youth um and uh, caps is one way of making a statement that we don't approve with this i think one of the things you could do is cap it where is it now 14 when the what 13 anyways and then as these uh, as market forces reduce the number keep the cap going down um make a statement that this level of population only, only needs so many distributors. Um, I think that um, some of the comments that have been made, especially by Vulcan and Ezra, are really concerning. Ezra was talking about people are getting off of their psychiatric medications thanks to marijuana. That's a really dangerous thing to do. I think Michael would probably point this out too. Um, people commit suicide when they're not on medications or they're, or they're doing their own self-medicating instead of psychiatric meds. I'm not a big proponent of psychiatric meds, but I do know that they have a, play, they have a role and just switching them out for marijuana is a very dangerous thing to be advocating for. Um, and uh, so also Michael pointed out that we have a large uh, community that's in recovery in town and, and we should support them. I think that that's really, really important. It's very difficult to walk through town smelling marijuana and seeing all these shops that you could sort of attracting you to go into it. Uh, this is a, a town with a large community in recovery. We have a lot, we have, a, we have a significant addiction problem in town and just saying, oh, what should we do, ho-hum, and not taking the data that's being presented, but going along with the people who are hypothesizing and their feelings about this and that, it's not a very um, credible way to go about this. So it's been frustrating, but I'm glad the discussion's going on. I think that I don't, I, I don't know if you passed it or not, but the idea of not having to go back and review this every three years, I, I, I hope that you didn't just eliminate that option at the beginning of the meeting. Um, because I think this needs to be reviewed, be reviewed, you know, frequently. The town, the face of the town has changed. We were wondering if that would happen. It's happened very quickly. And I think to ignore that is to harm our youth. And so let's please be careful and thoughtful as we go about decisions being made. Are you going to add anything? Else? No. Can I say something too? 
Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm Trish Armstrong. I teach health at Northampton High School. I do a whole unit on substance abuse. I know Ezra apologized for um, talking about the way he perceives prevention is taught. I just, I, I do want to add, I accept that apology because I don't teach Nancy Reagan era prevention. That's not what we do. Um, our students in this town have ninth grade health. That's their last formal health education class before they go off to college. If I have these students in the fall of this year, this is their last health education class before they go off to college. And I have a lot of things I need to cover. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about substances. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to my prevention brethren out there who did a fabulous job with the data, um, Heather and Kara, Caroline, um, Michael Stein as well. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. And um, don't do harm reduction in ninth grade. Uh, adolescent brains don't have the capacity um, to have that kind of gray area. It's the, what they hear from me is what I hope is being echoed at home, which is the longer you can delay this first use of cannabis or any drug, the better it is your chances of not having addiction problems in the future. That's the most that I will say in terms of um, harm reduction. But um, you know what they will hear from me is is uh, you know we study you know compelling cases and we um, anyway I, I know I'm getting off the track but um, my colleagues and I spend a, a lot of time talking about prevention. That's what we do. That's what we are. That's who we are. I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, at least thank you, uh, Rick. Yes, I uh, need my video turned on, please. <laughs> and thank you. Not sure why it was turned off. Uh, Let me just I, say, I'm not aware of any setting that has people's video turned off. So if someone does know how to change that, there's nothing that I've. It's not. It's not changed. Okay. okay. Well, Michael and I both lost our video. Um, so uh, I do want to thank also uh, Heather, Cara, Caroline, Michael, and everyone uh, here tonight. And I did want to say that I, I did start with a National Institute of Drug Abuse on uh, marijuana and hallucinogen use against uh, for adults and also cannabis exposure uh, associated with mental disorders in children that persist to uh, early adolescence. I spoke about nothing else. Uh, only uh, data. Uh, I've got a master's degree myself. I'm not a PhD researcher, but I appreciate data. And I'm a, an elementary school uh, teacher in Springfield. I, I teach special education. And at every assignment, our students are asked to provide evidence for what they say. Otherwise, they're just arbitrary statements. And we've heard a lot of that tonight as well. Um, so we appreciate data. And I also want to say that in terms of self-medicating and being off meds equaling suicide, well, I'm a parent uh, who lost a beautiful, brilliant uh, oldest son, Phil Haggerty, who grew up right here in um, Florence and uh, brought his band that he started in community college in San Francisco uh, to uh, uh, his latest album before he passed in 2019 to uh, the top 20 on the billboard charts really uh has been called a genius uh, by his peers so it is a life or death issue and it's such so important and um so again appreciative of everyone here tonight so I, i'm a grieving dad and uh, i'm taking action and uh, it, in my petition that has uh 570 signatures against euphorium and now we're not talking about euphorium but my question is, in the close of my petition, who's looking after our children and those in our adolescent community? So uh, I've got so much faith and belief in our esteemed counselors. And I did present the petition to uh, our, our wonderful mayor um, uh, uh, just uh, uh, prior to the weekend. So again, thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a late night. I got a, well, thank goodness, a four-year-old uh, calling for me. So thank you. All right, with that being said, I want to thank everybody for being involved in this, not only public, but also all the speakers who are part of the roundtable. Thank you, Volkan. Thank you, 
uh, Heather, and thank you, um, Sue, who's been here. Sorry, it's, it's getting kind of late for me. Um, and Ezra and, and everyone else. Um, and, and I know that these conversations, again, we'll be having more. I'm sure I will hear from a number of you again. I think it's important to hear from every member of our community. And as much as people hate to hear it, but the businesses who do sell cannabis are part of that community. So I wanted to make sure that they had a space and community resources seem to be a space to let businesses speak out. Um, and so when it comes to bias, I, I say that there is none when you have to talk about people who are also going to be your neighbors, you walk past the stores and whatnot. Um, again, thank you for your time. For that, I'm gonna close that portion and move back up the agenda. And we're almost done, counselors. Thank you for the late night. Uh, we have the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, I, to approve. I love it. Laura, can you roll all that? That's uh, moved by Council Elkins, and I think Council Maori seconded that. Yes. Laura, you're muted. Councillor Perry. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. Uh, after that, well, it feels really strange to have updates and announcements for committee members, but uh, if anyone wants to make an update or an announcement. Yes, the only announcement I was going to make, I think Kim's still on the line, is that the, the review we were talking about was facial uh, recognition surveillance um, technology. It was not relevant to the captain conversation and the, or the, the, the larger conversation. Yes. Uh, I'd also like to announce that I know Florence Night Out is coming. Oh. So we're talk about Florence, so uh, it's time to celebrate Florence. <laughs> Council Chair. I'll just state the dates of the next meetings um, related to this to, to the topic of um, marijuana, which is the City Services Committee on Monday, October 3rd at 4.30 p.m. I understand we'll be focusing, we'll have depart city department heads in attendance. We'll hear from them. Um, and then the Finance Committee on Wednesday, October 12th at 6 p.m., which will be on the financial implications to the city of a cap. Um, uh, so just wanted to make sure people were aware uh, of those upcoming meetings. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Jerry, can you actually say, I'm so sorry, can you actually say that again? I, I just did not get, I didn't get a chance to write down those dates. Can you just state those again? Sure, yes. So City Services, it's Monday, October 3rd at 4.30 p.m and the Finance Committee, Wednesday, October 12th at 6 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, Lance Jared, for being our calendar crew. Uh, with that being said, we are on to new business. If anyone has any new business to bring up, feel free to bring it up. I don't see any, and I am very much fishing for a movement to adjourn. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Laura. Councillor Elkins. Uh, yes. yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. And yes. Councillor Perry. Yes. We, we did it. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I think it's these hard conversations that we have to have in our city. So thank you guys for being a part of that.